Sorry. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 34th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I please remind you all to ensure that you have your mobile phones on silent? Agenda item one is an update on the fourth replacement crossing. This evidence session will take us forward from when we had our last meeting. Uh, on the 27th of November, the committee received a written update from Transport Scotland, providing details of the snagging work which will be starting this week, requiring a partial closure of the new crossing for several days. I'd like to welcome from the Scottish Government, Michelle Rennie, the Director of Major Transport Infrastructure Projects, and Lawrence Shackman, the Project Manager, and from Amy, Mark Arndt, representing the operating company for the fourth road bridge. Um, would, uh, Lawrence, would you like to make a short opening statement? Actually, Michelle's going oh, to Michelle's going to do it. <laughs> Sorry, my mistake. Michelle, would you like to make a short opening Indeed. statement? Thank you. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to be here this morning. And please excuse my voice. Um, to update the committee on the progress made since our last appearance on the 28th of June 2017. I can confirm that the project outturn cost range remains as at 1.325 to 1.35 billion. The Queen's Ferry Crossing opened to traffic on the 30th of August 2017 as planned and the four days of opening events gave nearly 70,000 people the opportunity to see the new bridge at close quarters. The Queen's Ferry Crossing experience walk across the new crossing took place on September the 2nd and 3rd with 97% of those who were successful in the ballot process actually participating on the day. This is a remarkably high participation rate for a free event of this scale. It provided a wonderful opportunity for charity fundraising and over £100,000 was raised through the Just Giving page for the event in addition to the money raised by charities by individuals themselves. Participants recognised the truly historic nature of the event and people with connections to the area and particularly to the bridges travelled from far and near to be part of it. Many people use the occasion as an opportunity to recognise their own personal challenges, and I was humbled to hear so many stories of personal bravery and achievement, including those relating to marriage proposals. It all contributed to an extremely positive event, which I'm sure in time will become an important part of Scottish history. The official opening took place on the morning of the 4th of September and was performed by Her Majesty the Queen, accompanied by the Duke of Edinburgh. The date was of particular local significance as it was the 53rd anniversary of the opening of the Fourth Road Bridge in 1964. While the weather was not all that favourable on the day, it did provide a flavour of the challenges that the men and women who worked on the project faced and overcame. Opportunities to participate in the opening events were highly sought after. The five major events which took place in the space of just over a week were organised to help meet unprecedented demand from the public, local MSPs and councillors, international and UK media, stakeholders, schools and local communities. Due to the high public demand for tickets for the Queensferry Crossing experience, over 226,000 people applied for 50,000 tickets. An additional schools and community day out was arranged for the 5th of September. This allowed over 6,000 pupils, teachers and parents from the 13 schools nearest to the project the chance to walk across the bridge. It also provided an opportunity for, for local community groups to access the crossing in the afternoon and evening that day. Face-to-face -face and social media feedback for all of these events was extremely positive. The event to light up the Queensferry Crossing was organised to specifically thank the workers and to showcase them alongside the, icon the iconic bridge that they were responsible for building. The spectacular videos and images from this event gained wide international media attention, including CNN, The New York Times, Al Jazeera and the South China Morning Post, amongst others. The extensive media coverage promoted both Scotland and the Three Bridges as a unique visitor destination. Overall the, events, <coughs> excuse me, overall, the events showcased both the incredible achievement of the workforce and a new iconic Scottish landmark. Since August, the fourth road bridge viewing platform has welcomed over 30,000 visitors. Initial evaluation shows that print media coverage alone generated an additional advertising value equivalent coverage of worth 1.2 million. 
The new roads in Queensferry Crossing opened to traffic in the early hours, reopened to traffic in the early hours of the 7th of September. And in the first few days, the crossing was extremely busy, primarily, we believe, due to bridge tourists, many of whom were observed to cross the bridge several times, looping around at, at Ferry Toll and South Queensferry junctions. This caused some disruption to local traffic due to the unusual traffic patterns. We have been closely monitoring traffic flows through the period and I can report that following the first two weeks of operation, traffic has now settled down to more normal patterns which are consistent with the patterns which existed prior to the Queensferry Crossing opening. It's worth reminding the committee that the project was originally designated De designated as the fourth replacement crossing and it was designed to at least maintain traffic flows at 2006 levels and not to increase capacity. At that time it was determined that any future traffic increases were to be accommodated through the use of the fourth road bridge as a public transport corridor. The project has been open to traffic in a phased manner. Following the completion of the connecting roads at the north end of the Fourth Road Bridge, this route was reopened to schedule bus services on the 13th of October. The footprint of the temporary traffic management was subsequently reduced and the speed limit increased from 40 to 50 miles an hour on the Queensferry Crossing itself and on the approach roads on the 6th of November. The installation and commissioning of the intelligent transport system is currently going through its final stages on the scheme and following the removal of the remaining traffic management, the Queensferry Crossing will have an increased speed limit of 70 miles an hour and the fourth road bridge will be opened to other buses, taxis and certain motorcyclists in December. Works on the intelligent transport uh, system, the structural health monitoring and mechanical and electric works electrical works are continuing inside the bridge decks, towers and piers. Regular handover meetings are being held with Amy, the fourth bridge's operating company, to prepare them for the operation and maintenance of the bridge and the approach roads. Community relations continue to be extremely good with the North and South community forums who are due to meet for the last time this evening. The schools programme at the Contact and Education Centre in South Queensferry has proved extremely popular and will continue to operate for the remainder of the academic year to June 2018 and its future use will be reviewed at that time. To date, the project has hosted over 70, 75,000 visitors from across the globe, including 25,000 school children from right across Scotland. Thank you for the opportunity to provide an update this morning. And we would welcome any questions that you may have for Lawrence, Mark, or myself. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Stuart, I think you've got the first question. Uh, thank you very much. Now that the bridge is a success, I can uh, confess I was responsible for the legislation as Minister, apart from Stage 3, which Keith Brown did due to snow. Um, but one of the things we're, we're now seeing is uh, snagging, as the uh, uh, convener referred to. And I note that it's uh, around the joints. And historically, joints have been the big issue on the existing bridge. Are joints going to be a big problem on this bridge? Uh, uh, and uh, was it expected? It, the, the issue with the snagging is, you're correct in saying it is around the joints, but it's not due to the joints. Um, the issue here is around the surfacing, the level of the surfacing immediately adjacent to the joints and the effect that, that those levels have on the joints. So at the moment the surfacing has been laid marginally too high either side of the joints and that is a, a workmanship issue. Um, the joints themselves are fine but the concern is about the impact that the use of the, the road at 70 miles an hour would create on the joints should traffic be allowed to traverse it at those speeds. Uh, and all the costs associated with this will lie with the contractor? That's correct. This is a, the, the, there's an opportunity within the contract for them to rectify any any defective works, I suppose, or any snagging issues. Um, snagging issues are a normal part of, of any major contract like this. People who've done up their own houses will appreciate that there are snagging issues even at that scale. Um, and all costs associated with those snagging issues and finishing works will be borne by the contractor. Uh, including the costs of doing the diversions and things like Correct, that? Correct, all yeah. costs. Right. Okay, um, I know we have quite a few questions. Uh, it seems to have come at quite short notice, and perhaps that, that's a bit of a surprise. Is that a fair comment? The, the issue about the levels on the joints were, was known about in, um, 
in, Oct in August prior to opening. Um, what we didn't fully understand at that point in time was what the impact of those level differences would be. And at that point, the contractor was investigating with the uh, joint supplier, and this is a bespoke joint for this bridge, there's no, there's no other just quite the same as it. Um, they were investigating with the joint supplier whether there was an opportunity to undertake um, a less disruptive, I suppose, um, solution. Um, the other thing about this is because effectively it's, it's road surfacing that's at fault here. And road surfacing is quite a weather sensitive operation. What we didn't want to do was, it was alert the public to potential dates and then the weather change in the intervening period. We have reasonable certainty with a five day forecast ahead. We have more certainty about the first three days of that of that forecast. So at this point, we're satisfied that we can get um, a sufficient weather window to allow us to start and complete the works within the period. However, we also have um, hold points within those works so that were the weather to change um, during that period, we will still get the road reopened by Wednesday morning, the latest. And how would you describe the potential disruption that you are planning for? We've done some work on um, estimating what delays are likely and we think that it's likely to be or of the order of a few minutes in the morning, two to four minutes um, in the morning and evening peaks um, because effectively we're providing exactly the same capacity, we're just rerouting the southbound traffic. And, and reducing the speed limit. Correct, we're reducing right. the speed limit to 40 miles an hour on both bridges for the Thank duration you, of the works. Um, sorry, Michelle, could you just clarify for me? I think you said it was a works defect and uh, at some stage during your answer there, and previously you said it was a design defect. Is it a defect of the design because the joints weren't known about, or is it a defect of the of no. the actual work surfacing? Uh, apologies if I wasn't clear about that. It's a it's a workmanship issue. The design is correct, um, but the surfacing wasn't laid to the tolerances set out in the design. And and that was identified before the the bridge opened. That's correct. Okay, sorry. Thank you for that clarification, Jamie. Uh, so, uh, just to carry on, so, so you knew in August that there, there would be a problem, but you need a window of opportunity to do the works. So why did the public only hear about this on Monday? The reason that we, we've, uh, well, first of all, the contractor hadn't designed the solution to this until um, probably a couple of weeks ago. Um, um, and uh, like I said, the, 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 the thing that causes the greatest disruption on the, the road network is driver confusion. So what we didn't want to do was put out dates and then change those dates. What we wanted to do was put out dates that we had reasonable certainty about. And we could only do that once we had some clarity about what the weather window would be, particularly at this time of the year, because the works are vulnerable to heavy rain and also particularly low temperatures. And as you know, the diversion route is vulnerable to particularly high winds. So we wanted to be able to have quite a bit of certainty about about the weather window before we put out information which otherwise may confuse drivers. Uh, is it fair to say that there are also uh, problems associated with the, the wind shielding? There, I, again, there are minor snagging issues with the wind shielding. There's nothing, nothing, um, nothing in comparison to what has been reported. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a considerable amount of wind shielding on the bridge. Some aspects of that wind shielding need um, a bit of finishing work. We'll, we'll look to do that and any other work we can get done during these uh, few days where we have the lane restrictions on, again, to try and minimise any future disruption. But in the event that we didn't have these days uh, with lane closures on, we could have done those works under um, hard shoulder closures at night in the normal way that maintenance gets done on any structure. Okay. Can I confirm, who, who made the decision to proceed with the opening of the bridge, knowing that there would be problems post-opening and that the bridge would have to be closed or partially closed at some point after opening? Well, the issue there is that there was no knowledge that the bridge would have to be partially closed post-opening. There was a view taken that there were no safety implications 
uh, uh, in opening the bridge at 40 miles an hour and indeed in increasing the speed limit to 50 miles an hour. Um, through the discussions that the uh, contractor has had with the joint manufacturer, it has become clear that there are potential issues in opening the bridge at uh, to a speed limit of 70 miles an hour. And what we want to do is ensure that we avoid those issues and don't do anything to impact the long-term durability of that joint. So the press release that came out on Monday, which I have in front of me, uh, the wording of it almost sounds like this was this, this partial closure this week was part of the plan of achieving 70 miles per hour, whereas it sounds like from today um, it wasn't part of the plan. So I, I'm a bit confused. Was, was there always a plan to partially was, close to, to, re, re, to was, address the surfacing issues which you knew about in August? Was, or is this a reactionary problem to something you've just discovered in the last few weeks? There was always a plan to get to 70 miles an hour in a phased way. We have moved from 40 to 50 and we had always intended to move to 70. We knew that there were some finishing works that would be required before we moved to 70. Until recently, we weren't aware of what the solution would be uh, for these surfacing works and what sort of impact that they would have on road users or indeed what lane closures, if any, would be required. Okay, and just finally, moving forward, uh, do you foresee any further potential closures or rerouting outside of the emergency procedures of the bridge? that you are aware of now as opposed to something you may discover in the future? Well, I think we've been consistently um, saying, I think since before the bridge open, opened, that there would be finishing and snagging works required. And the contract allows for those works to happen um, up to next September. Um, so, that, you know, at, at no additional cost. So there, there will be some um, additional works going on throughout that period, and they will um, include the things that I mentioned earlier, the mechanical and electrical works, the um, intelligent transport system, the lifts to the towers, and, and that kind of thing. But there was no reason to... Um, delay opening the bridge for those kinds of works, that, that sort of thing is entirely normal on, um, on any infrastructure project. Okay, so just, just to clarify, I, so the, I don't You're, think the question was answered with, with greatest respect. You know. If it's a very concise question, because there are a lot of questions to okay, get through. So will there be further closures between now and the next September? There will be some lane restrictions happening between now and September, yes. Thank you. Sorry, just before I move on, because I know Gail Ross got a question. Just, I remember hearing evidence before that one of the reasons why the uh, bridge uh, opening didn't come originally as quickly as was anticipated was that the resurfacing couldn't be done in cold weather. It appears that we're doing now resurfacing at the potentially the coldest time of the year. It, 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 is that right, or have I, if I misunderstood that? We are... I mean, resurfacing happens as a matter of course across the Scottish road network whenever it's needed. Um, so and, and, for, uh, and emergency repairs in particular take place all the time. This isn't a time of year that you would necessarily choose to resurface, but because we have a weather window that allows us to do that, it's okay. What we're doing is 15 metres on, on each side, which is relatively straightforward to do. We probably wouldn't choose to resurface the entire bridge at this time of the year because that's going to take much longer and you have less certainty about the weather window. Okay, go. Hi, good morning panel. Um, Michelle, I just wanted to really quickly touch on um, something that Jamie just said about ongoing works and you mentioned different things that are going to be happening over the course of the next year or so and, and these are par for the course with a, a major structure. Um, I wonder if maybe you could tell us a little bit more about those or if it's more convenient to give us a little bit more detail, maybe write to the committee with a list of ongoing projects and, and timescales, if that's okay. We'd be happy to, to provide more information to the committee. Thanks. Right can I ask about the Forth Road Bridge and when it will be open um, to public transport, fully open to public transport? Um, we intend that to be uh, opened up before Christmas as part of the move to 70 miles per hour operation, um, opening up the, the public transport corridor um, on the Forth Road Bridge happened before Christmas. Okay. Um, and... Does, that you were saying that coincides with the 70 miles an hour on the new bridge? 
Well, well the, uh, is the fourth road bridge going to be 70 miles an hour? No, no. The, the, the fourth road bridge will be, um, as it always has been, um, normal um, 50 miles per hour speed limit on the fourth road bridge. Um, I think Mark's probably better place to tell you why it can't be increased from, from 50 miles an hour. Um, the bridge no, it's, being it's, it's fine, I just wanted design. to clarify. So, because no, it'll, it'll be 50 miles an hour on the fourth road bridge. 70 miles per hour, subject to the variable mandatory speed limits on the Queensferry crossing. Yeah. No, I thought it would be strange Effective. if it suddenly yeah. <laughs> went up in speed. <coughs> the, um, I use the, the Queensferry crossing quite often, and I'd hoped, I guess, that the new crossing would mean that there would be fewer tailbacks at peak times, and that really hasn't changed. Do you see the increase in speed dealing with that, or is the tailbacks at peak times something we're just going to have to live with? I think in some ways the, the increase to, from 40 to 50 has made some difference because um, when the vehicles are moving faster on the main carriageway, there's slightly um, bigger gaps between the vehicles, so it makes it easier for traffic to merge from the slip roads. And then um, as you go to 70 miles an hour, the gaps between vehicles becomes uh, bigger still, so there's more opportunity for people to merge. But fundamentally, there's two lanes on the, the Queensferry crossing in both directions, and there, there were two lanes, or there still are two lanes, in each direction on the fourth row bridge. So there isn't a step change in capacity as such. Um, the thing that we, we keep saying to, to people is it's a lot more resilient. Um, we have the hard shoulders for breakdowns, and we've already seen um, people who have broken down in their, in their vehicles being able to move and, and use the hard shoulders, and that's helped to keep the traffic moving on the bridge. And, of course, we have the windshielding, which has also provided a lot more resilience um, to, to, to wind-related incidents, and it will continue to do so as we go forward in time. Next question. There's a couple uh, queuing up. Could I bring them in and then come back to you? M Mike and then John, if I may. I'm just concerned that the right lessons are learned for major projects in the future. Um, I use that bridge regularly, and well, all the time, at least twice a week. Um, it was quite clear that there was huge congestion in the early days, uh, and I put it down to the 40 mile an hour restriction. As soon as that was lifted, and I use this regularly, as I say, as soon as that was lifted, it was quite obvious to me that moving to 50 miles an hour, and it's interesting to what was just being said, made a huge difference to the congestion across that bridge. Huge difference. And if only we'd had the 50 mile an hour at the beginning, then I think we would have not had all the congestion issues that people were getting anxious about. So really, I, I accept that initial few days there may have been tourism about people looking at the bridge. But once that was away and people were using it regularly, we still had the congestion, and it wasn't until the 6th of November that suddenly we managed to get that, that ease. In an ideal world, it would have opened at 50 miles an hour, but there were other reasons. Um, for example, finishing off some central reserve barrier works and um, at either end of the bridge as part of the, the transfer of traffic um, from the fourth road bridge to the Queensbury crossing had to be undertaken in the central reserve and we couldn't do that work um, at 50 miles an hour. We had to limit the traffic to 40 mm -hmm. miles an hour for safety reasons. So why, why, why didn't we just make sure that all the work was done before we opened it so we wouldn't have had all the congestion for those weeks in that because period? Because we couldn't actually transfer the traffic over to the new bridge. We had the gaps in the central reserve to get the traffic through to the fourth no, no, road bridge. No, my, my point so, is... Um, my point is, why, why did we open early, uh, open on time when the work wasn't done? And we could, have, uh, we could have made sure the work was done and then opened at 50 miles an hour and then nobody would have had the congestion. <laughs> it, it was physically impossible to do that because okay. if, you, if you remember, um, the traffic was orientated. So it came, if you're coming from the north, um, you travel across the, the emergency <laughs> link on the north side of the bridge and the northbound traffic also through the central reserve gap onto the new northbound carriageway so as you come from there. the fourth row bridge. Now. So you've right. got a gap okay. in the central reserve, right. and there's no way of doing that without moving okay. the traffic around. So in, I understand terms of that. Your, in terms of your, your wider question about mm. learning for the future, yeah. um, where we can we incentivise uh, and where we can and where it's safe to do so, we incentivise contractors to uh, run temporary traffic um, management schemes at 50 at miles 50. an hour. Oh, I'm pleased to hear that. And we've done that on M8. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm pleased to hear that, Convener. Thank you. Right, uh, a quick question from John, and then back to Rodo. <coughs> Thanks. You, you said that there was no step change in capacity, i.e., there's two lanes in each direction, so there's still four lanes as there were before for most traffic. However, the total capacity we now have, if you include the a hard shoulder, on the new bridge we've got six lanes, on the old bridge we've got four, so we've got a total of ten lanes now, and we're only using four for most traffic. I mean, will there be consideration given at some point to using more of the ten lanes? Well, the fourth crossing act, going back to Stuart Stevenson's earlier um, point, um, was all predicated on there not being a step change in capacity basically 2006 levels, which is when the, the Fourth Crossing Act was, was ostensibly based on, and that any increase in demand to cross the Fourth would be met by public transport. So although there's, as you quite rightly say, in theory, a lot more um, capacity there, the policy is to promote public transport to fulfil the requirement to, to cross the Fourth going forward. Now, no one's got a crystal ball. There may be a change of policy in the future. And yes, you could change the, the configuration in the future, but that's the, the Fourth Crossing Act. We also expect to be able to maximise the efficiency of the new infrastructure once all the intelligent transport systems are fully operational so that we can use ramp metering and the like to control any queuing. Okay. Thank you. Did you have a follow-up question before I go to Fulton? I, I think I'll leave it at that, Convener. Okay. Th that. Thank you, Red. Uh, Fulton. Thanks, Convener. Thanks, panel. Um, I suppose I've just got a wee follow-up to the, the earlier conversation uh, there. Was there any consideration at all uh, at the pre-planning stage given to the new crossing being three-lane? Uh, yeah, there, there is some flexibility built into the project um, looking to the future. So, as I say, if there was a change in policy in the future, you could convert the, the hard shoulders to a running lane and run it as an all-lane running, as they, as they um, phrase it, um, elsewhere in the UK. So that, that possibility is there if, um, if it's uh, wanted to be pursued in the future. OK, um, thanks for that. Uh, my um, substantial question uh, is relating to the Queen's Ferry Crossing experience, and I think, uh, Michelle, in your... Uh, opening statement, you've kind of given a, a good overview of that. Um, I have to say that I was uh, one of the lucky people to be on the Queen's Ferry Crossing experience and got to take my two children across, so I'd like to personally thank you for that experience and the clerks here as well for uh, being able to set up that, that great day. Um, as I said, you've already kind of covered what the, 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 um, what, what the main outcomes of that were. Um, but there has been some discussion as well about the cost. Can I maybe get your view on, if there's been some sort of analysis done, what that experience meant in terms of um, benefits for the, the local area, in terms of maybe jobs uh, and uh, productivity for the area? Well, it, I mean, it, it's, I suppose it's, it's quite early days to understand the, the full impact of what that will mean. Um, certainly we're satisfied with the, the media exposure that we had Visit Scotland have given us some statistics that they they believe that their social media reached 1.9 million people, and certainly the reach of um, the the news, if you like, about the the new bridge, the only one of its kind in the world, has reached right across the globe. So there's no doubt that we have a level of exposure that we've never had before, and the the messaging around all of that was overwhelmingly positive about Scotland as a good place to live and to work, about the uniqueness of the area, you know, where you have three bridges in three centuries. And we will be looking to capitalise on that, working with Fife Council and their um, tourism strategy to identify what can happen you know, with respect to uh, a visitor centre in the area. And that's work that's ongoing at the moment. And um, I mentioned the contact and education centre and there's potential to use that area to, to capitalise on some of that. And I did mention that since, you know, the interest in the area has peaked, and there's no doubt about that, in the last few months, um, where we've had, I think, 32,000 um, people visit the viewing platform um, you know, they're numbers that have been unheard of up to this. Yeah, I, I suppose the, the, the point I was um, trying to ascertain was if you were sat satisfied that the costs of putting on such an experience, which, which will be um, questioned, 
uh, and ri rightly so, that's, that's our job. Um, if you are satisfied that that is offset by the uh, potential benefits both at a local level uh, to the local area and surrounding uh, parts and the national perspective as a whole? Um, I, th I think we were pretty satisfied with, with what we got. We um, looked at putting on additional events in North and South Queensferry, but when we did some more analysis on that, because of the road network in the area, um, potentially ad adding additional traffic into those areas would have compromised the quality of the events and the ability to get to and from the events that we, the main events that we had on, on offer. So as a result, we, um, we ran um, some uh, we, we wanted to keep the focus of that quite local for local people who'd, who'd witnessed the construction of the schemes. So we did some animation around um, South Queen's Ferry um, flags and bunting and the like, and we kept that up until the ferry came in a couple of weeks after the... The, uh, the cruise ship came in a couple of weeks after the events. Um, we ran some uh, tea parties and the like. And uh, overall, with the, the level of community engagement that we had, the local community seemed to be quite happy with that. Excellent. Thank you. So, and just to confirm that, uh, that you <coughs> kindly sent a letter to the committee outlining all the costs at three and a half million and one or two other points. So move on. So thank you for that letter. John. <coughs> Thanks, convener. Following on from Fulton McGregor. Um, I understand you had a number of community forums uh, during the running of the project and also Transport Scotland were providing a regular project updates. Do, do you feel that's been successful on the whole? Um, yes, being part of the, the community forums um, right from the start and, and pre-construction, I think they've been very constructive, um, been a great opportunity for um, the local communities to, to come and ask questions for us to, as a project team to provide information both on um, current events as they were at that particular time and for uh, uh, future events, um, basically to embrace the local community as much as we could do um, and explain where there were issues, why things had gone in a certain direction, um, to take constructive, constructive criticism on board as well um, when that was uh, levelled to us. Um, yeah, we've tried to build bridges, excuse the pun, <laughs> with the local community. So I, I think they've been very successful. Um, I think the, the interval, three-month interval, has been the right sort of interval as well. We've also had members of... Sorry, the, the three-month interval? Three months. Uh, each of the community forums oh, is, sorry, right, right, is right, held right, every, right. every three months right. through the, the course of the project. Um, and obviously, in terms of the general public, that's been supplemented with the community update um, leaflets, which have also gone out typically three monthly as well, and also for the general public um, in and around the project wider um, within Scotland and elsewhere and around the world. We've got the websites which have provided um, a plethora of information, whether that be old documentation around the reasoning for the project to traffic management updates about current and upcoming events. So I think generally I'd like to think that the, uh, the communication focus with the local communities and wider has been really very positive. Now I understand for some of the residents of South Queen's Ferry it now takes them longer to get to Edinburgh because mm -hmm. they cannot get on I think off Ferry Muir Road yes. onto the roundabout. Mm -hmm. Was that something they understood was going to happen yeah, beforehand? We, we um, explained that extensively, extensively to the, uh, the local communities uh, at the planning stage and it was also um, brought to the fore at the uh, fourth crossing bill stage. Um, so, yes, there are some people that have a further distance to travel, um, but there are also a lot of people that have less distance to travel as well. So there's a, a balance to be struck there, and that really uh, influenced the positioning of the junction um, back in 2009, 2010, at the time of the bill. Um, there was a lot of discussion with the local community about that. Okay. And uh, finally, for future projects, if there's other projects happening, especially even smaller projects, do you think there's lessons from your consultation forums and things that other projects could learn from? Yeah, I think it's definitely engage with the community as much as you can, as early as you can. Um, but when you do engage early, you have to have meaningful uh, discussions. I think looking back on things, sometimes members of the community may be asked as questions. We didn't have the information to give them the answer. Um, it's a time where you need to go as a project team to go away and do your homework and come back with um, 
you know, high quality information. It might be that you come back with two or three options uh, around a particular uh, question that the member of the public is asking about. But it's very important to engage at a, an early stage. So that's applicable to any size of project anywhere. I think the other key thing is that um, using um, technology to help people understand what the project's going to look like. So, for example, on our project, we had a virtual reality model. Um, a model where you could actually visualise what the project was going to look like and we used that extensively in the early stages to show landscaping, um, the distance from a person's house to the, to the road uh, and what, what kind of impacts there would be and how they could be best mitigated. Across our other projects, we're also learning a lot of lessons from um, from the fourth replacement crossing. We are, for the A9, we intend to enhance what we've done in terms of engagement with schools and build a programme where we start to engage with schools. At, at the time, we started to engage with 11-year-olds with a view towards the fact that they would be ready to enter the, the market as apprentices and graduates at the time we were building the A9. We're running a programme with them that um, uh, ties in with the curriculum for excellence. We're working with the uh, local universities and with the Civil Engineering Contractors Association to help develop apprentices and graduate routes. Um, and we are also looking at, on some of our smaller projects, identifying dedicated resources to community engagements because, you know, in the past where we've maybe got it wrong has been that where people are doing this as a bolt-on part of their day job and actually, um, you know, communities expect a little bit more and they're entitled to a little bit more nowadays. Okay. Thank you. Um, <coughs> John uh, Finney, yours is uh, the next question. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, uh, panel. Um, I'm grateful to Mr Shankman for outlining the purpose of the legislation and the issue of capacity and the role that public transport would play. Now, uh, we have the force replacement crossing uh, public transport strategy was initially published in 2012 and uh, the most recent update on uh, that it uh, seems to have been that the, it last met in April of uh, 2017. I wonder if you could outline what plans, if any, there are to promote cross forth uh, bus services now that the crossing is open and how you envisage the implementation of the public transport strategy being taken forward, please. Actually, um, the most recent public transport working group meeting was on the 24th of October, so it was very recently, That's actually. Um, one thing I will say, coming out of that meeting, which is attended by all the, the relevant bus com companies, Lothian Buses, Stagecoach, First Bus, Confederation of Passenger Transport, um, and the local authorities, um, was a, a, a positive um, outlook from the, the bus operating companies in terms of patronage at Halbeath Park and Ride, Ferry Toll Park and Ride. I believe they're now over 90% full most days. So that's a, a good positive in terms of encouraging people to use uh, public transport. So that was, that was one of the things that was discussed at the most recent meeting. Um, you're right there, the public transport strategy was published um, a while ago. And the, the idea um, now is to reproduce the interventions table that was included in that strategy and give an update on where it is and we will, we will publish that in, in, the, in the coming months so that everyone's clear about how e each of the in interventions has, has uh, progressed. So some of the interventions, if, uh, if you're not familiar, were the introduction of hard shoulder running um, on the Fife ITS uh, project on the north side of the, of the, of the fourth, um, which we actually implemented as part of the Fife ITS project. So that's complete, and we've um, that measure, which was originally intended to be a temporary measure, is now a permanent measure because it's been successful, it's safe, and it operates well. Um, so that's just one example. Some of the other interventions, which are a little bit more wider ranging, they go down to um, potential bus improvements at Newbridge Junction, for example. Some of these will either be progressed via the relevant local authority or be considered further as part of the, the next stage of the strategic transport projects review. So there'll be a, a commentary on each of those interventions in the, the update that will be published in 2018. Um, thanks very much for that. Um, I previously asked questions about the subject and particularly the implications of um, additional public transport beyond the scope of the bridge, as it were. So it's interesting you mentioned New Bridge. Has there been any assessment made of that? Because, of course, we want to encourage greater use of public transport. Um, not an assessment as such. 
uh, working with, with stage, Stagecoach, who are the, the main operator of the, the fourth corridor, if you like, yeah. um, they're keen to um, see how um, the project performs once it's completely open. So talking about the managed crossing strategy being fully in place so they can start to gauge um, where they can introduce potentially new services, um, potentially adjust existing services to suit the demands of people crossing the fourth. Um, there is a marketing campaign um, which Transport Scotland and Fife have been, Fife Council have been working on, um, which is called Fife in the Fast Lane, um, and that's already started, and uh, that's trying to um, promote uh, the park and ride sites even further, um, looking at not only bus travel but also looking at the train as a, as a means of crossing the fourth, because obviously that's a, a very uh, valuable asset to have. And also the, the subject of smart cards and smart tickets as well, trying to encourage people because it's easier to actually buy tickets um, with, with these smart cards. Um, and I think go going forward, the second phase of that campaign is to um, look at the interoperability of smart cards um, so that they can be used um, across uh, several modes. And the fourth corridor is the focus of that campaign. So there is a lot going on already, and there's more to do in terms of promoting public transport across the fourth. OK, thank you. That's very reassuring. Thank you. OK, thank you, John. Uh, Stuart, your next question. Um, we've talked a bit about uh, the lessons learned from how we manage relationships, and I want to just turn quite briefly, I think, uh, to whether there are internal lessons for how you in Transport Scotland manage things. Um, when I used to lecture to postgraduates on project management, I always said successful projects need an intelligent buyer. Are Transport Scotland learning lessons from this in procurement planning and financial planning control, uh, relationships with contractors and, and so on and so forth? That means you'll be a more intelligent buyer in future. I hope so. <laughs> uh, there, are, there are quite a lot of things that have come out of this. Um, first of all, our, um, our attitude to risk um, and about how we quantify that risk. And one of the things that has been particularly successful on this contract is that we have been, we've spent a lot of time identifying what the risks are and allocating sums of money towards those and we have strategies for managing those. And who bears the liability for each of those risks is clearly understood between ourselves and the contractor. So that avoids the need for, you know, um, an argument or, or litigation if, down the line. Um, so that's very important. So uh, just before we move on from that, did you therefore have a risk register that was yes. shared between yourself as purchaser and the contractor we that was a, agreed? We have... A, each organisation has... Well, through the construction phase, each organisation has their own risk register because yeah. at that point the liabilities are already split. So, um, so it was already well understood at that point. But in terms of our own financial management through the construction period, which after all is the most expensive time, um, we had a very good handle on that and were, you know, through our governance we were reviewing it very frequently. Um, both at a project level and as a subgroup to our project board and at our project board, so you know it was getting a lot of scrutiny. Um, in terms of the the expertise, we um, we employed people who were experienced bil bridge builders. It's a very specialist um, it's a very specialist area, and it's important that we employed people who clearly understood what was involved in that. Um, in terms of um, uh, other sort of um, other areas, we have. Um, I suppose we've learned a little bit about how we communicate what the challenges of building civil engineering projects are. Um, in terms of you know the potential impacts that the weather would have, we had a significant time allocation allowed for weather in this project, but as you know, it it, it wasn't quite enough. Okay, can I say it's clear you've learned a lot of lessons, yes. and I know others have other questions. <clears throat> and there's time for a follow-up if you. Oh well, no, no, I, I'm quite happy if Michelle wants to continue. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that um, only last week um, there was an article that was produced by by the World Economic Forum, which did a comparison between the Queen's Free Crossing and the the new Bay Bridge in San Francisco, and it basically purported to say. Um, 
that Scotland got it right and America didn't do so well. Um, it said, in particular, three good practices contributed to the high quality processes and outcomes. The UK planners diagnosed the problem early, took their time with careful design up front, and built and sustained an inclusive coalition of stakeholders. The evidence speaks for itself. So really quite complementary to um, everything that we've done with regards to the Queen's Free Crossings development. To be honest, we have a huge lessons learned log, which we continue to update um, to reflect the, the final parts of the, of the project. We're just doing that at the moment. And you know, I, I could literally spend a day going through all of the lessons that we've learned, um, whether they be governance lessons, risk um, lessons, practical design lessons, well, let me, people let me, lessons. Let me ask one supplementary, then, if the community allows me. Um, one of the big areas of risk in, in any big project is change. And mm -hmm. there is no big project where there is no change. Um, I think a project dies when there's mm -hmm. no change. In particular, did you, 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 you have an effective method of con identifying, controlling, allocating responsibility for change that worked, yes. that will help you in future mm -hmm. projects? Yeah, I think there's, there's two sides to that. There was, during the design and development stage, working with our um, consultants, we had a, a change control mechanism. So we had an initial um, plan of the work that they had to, to perform. And, for example, one of the early things was the original assumption was the fourth row bridge wasn't going to be used in the future. This is way back in 2000 and early 2008. But as a project team, we thought it would be sensible to, to look at that, um, reconsider that, 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 uh, that particular line of thought. So one of the change controls was to actually have a look um, in detail at what, could, what use could be made of the fourth row bridge. And that work um, was carefully detailed and eventually uh, formed the, the, the managed crossing strategy I'm, that I'm we're realising. So there's those early yeah. lessons. And then with the contractor, um, there's, there's various mechanisms in the, in mechanisms in the contract to, to vary the contract, which we try our hardest not to do because we want to just keep the contract as it's um, defined, so it's a, a tight contract. But there's also mechanisms in there for the contractor su to suggest changes and some cost-sharing initiatives can come to the to forefront, which benefit both parties. There's a, there's a fine line between fixing the scope and a fixed out term cost and actually being able to take on and take advantage of good ideas and innovation as it arises. Um, and I, I suppose that, that sort of highlights the importance of the governance regime and ensuring that, I mean, for our governance here, we had very wide representation on our project board. We had representation from a number of stakeholders, from our finance, <coughs> sorry, our finance colleagues in Scottish Government and from industry representatives. So we had quite a, and from people who delivered other different kinds of projects in the past. So we had we had quite a varied sort of view on the project board, so, which gave us quite a balanced um, opinion. And, <clears throat> I'm sorry, um, what was particularly useful was that the people who were empowered to make the decisions were independent of the project team, but sufficiently close to the project to have good visibility about what was happening and what the impact of those decisions were, so that the decisions could be taken quickly. Because sometimes, even when something is a good idea, if you don't act at the right time, you lose the benefit, you lose the momentum. Um, so I'll that's just, been very I'll important. I'll just make the observation, I worked, of course, in software projects, much more complex in change terms, but we always had the option of dumping the difficult changes into phase two. You'd know phase two. Indeed. Um, and I think I'm just going to leave that, that statement there and uh, move straight on to, uh, I think it's Richard. It, it, yes. um, good question. morning. Um, I'm going to bring Mr. Mark Arndt in uh, now. A um, couple of questions for you. Scottish Government awarded a five-year long contract for the management, maintenance and operation of the fourth floor bridge and when completed the Queensway of course and to Amy on this 18th December 2014. So that's going to come up 2019 um, for renewal. Um, but I'll part that for a minute. The first question is, is there a, a warranty period for the Queensway of course and how will warranty repairs be managed? I take it it'll be the contractor who will do the the warranty, not Amy. Can, 
can I answer that? Um, you do that, and um, then um, the, the There's a, a defects correction period, which is the normal, the normal sort of thing that we have on projects like this. It's a five-year defects correction period. So in the event that any defects arise over that period of time. That Five will, years. That's correct. That will be the responsible that will be the responsibility of the contractor and is contained within the costs we have already spent on this job. Okay. Right. Um, so what responsibility for the management maintenance of the Queen's Ferry Crossing has been transferred to Amy to date and are there any still any uh, responsibilities still to be transferred? In regards to transfers has there been any tupi transfers? You know what tupi is, Mr. Arn? Yeah, went through an extension. Um, right. Was there any tupi transfers when you took over the bridge? And if any of your workmen were to be tupi transferred elsewhere, would Amy pay any redundancy? Right, OK. When Amy, Amy were awarded the contract in 2014, but the service delivery, we had a six-month mobilisation period, so it actually commenced on the 1st of June 2015. From that date, there's a five-year um, initial contract period that's extendable up to 10 years under our existing contract. All staff that were previously with the historic um, Fourth Estuary Transport Authority did to pay transfer to Amy under the legislation at that time. And indeed, probably 95% of the, those employees are still with us um, through a couple of retirements and resignations and the like. Um, going forward, um, we've no ambition to make any redundancies or the like, quite the contrary, we're a growth organisation and when the Queen's Ferry Crossing is fully transferred to us, there's additional obligations there. So quite the contrary, we're looking to increase employment rather than reduce it, but Amy are a, a multinational company, we do dozens of two-pay transfers every year across different contracts and indeed we have specific uh, teams that specialise in that and at the time of uh, mobilisation or demobilisation of contracts there's a team dedicated to support the, the, the resource management at that time. So if there was an occasion where, uh, Amy is quite a big company, your uh, headquarters is based in Oxford I think? That's correct, yep. Um, you know, so if Amy is to be transferring people and those people are not taken by another company, would Amy pay redundancy? No, we, we, no. Wouldn't, we wouldn't be looking to pay it, make anybody redundant. The, the two pay employees would either have an option to retain employment with Amy, and it might be in another contract or a similar what if, role. What if there's or no employment if they with Amy? If they, they have an obligation. Is there a, a specific reason why I'm asking this question? There is a specific reason why I'm asking uh -huh. this question. And you may want to tell your fellow colleagues in North Lancashire to, to uh, get on with sorting something out. But basically, okay. I want to know, does Amy pay redundancy? And, and of, of course she would pay redundancy, but not associated Mark, with... Mark, can I come in at this stage and just say, if there's a specific issue in North Lanarkshire, it may be appropriate for uh, Mr Lyle to it's write okay. I've, I've, I've got my regarding that. And I, and I think that, Mark, you, you can very much take your answers uh, to do with the... Uh, the bridge and, and leave it at that and I think you've made quite a clear statement on that but if you want to add anything to it I'm happy no, to take an add. My, me personally have nothing to do with North Lanarkshire. Right, um, I, I, I'm very happy to ignore the comments about North Lanarkshire yeah. and move on uh, to Mr Chapman with a, with, with a, sh a short question. A couple of short ones. Um, Amy you manages the approach roads north and south of the bridge uh, how do you intend to engage with road users and communities at either end of the bridge in the, in the near future? Um, as Lauren said, there is a, a kind of strong uh, community engagement programme ongoing just now. We'll be looking to continue that. Uh, we currently participate in the Fourth Bridges Forum, um, and as part of that, there's various community and public engagement events. Mm. What we will be doing is targeting them at appropriate times when there's something to tell the, the communities and the like. But we do have a really strong community engagement um, presence in, in the Fourth Bridges area. Um, we engage currently with the community councils on both sides of the bridge. Um, this summer, we refurbished uh, South Queen's Ferry Community Centre, which was free of charge. Every AMA employee is entitled to one day's paid community service day. 
and at Forth Bridges we employ about 100 staff, so each of them is eligible to take that. Um, as I say, we work with the communities to identify targeted and focused community uh, engagement events, and as Lauren said, the continuation of the, the current successful programme, something that we'll be looking to take forward. I'll just add, we're just about to publish um, an updated Engaging with Communities document, which is titled Fourth Bridges Operation and Maintenance, which outlines how you can contact any part of the project in, in relation to a piece of maintenance work or the bridge, Fourth Row Bridge or Queen's Free Crossing, and talks about how um, engagement will continue into the future. Yeah, I'll just go on that part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one, one small one. Uh, the, the, the old bridge, the Fourth Road Bridge, um, can you outline any plans for, sig for significant maintenance on, on that bridge? And if so, how will that affect the uh, cyclists and pedestrians being able to cross uh, if any of that work is, is ongoing? Okay. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a huge capital investment programme currently underway and planned for the, the coming years. Pedestrian and cyclist will be largely unaffected by any of the works. Um, we always keep at least one of the cycle footways open at all times, with the exception of wind closures and events like that. Mm -hmm. At the moment, you're probably familiar with the Truss End Link project that closed the bridge a couple of years ago. The actual damage link itself has been entirely replaced and a, a successful trial undertaken and the remaining seven links are being replaced at the moment. The other big schemes that we have going forward are there's a cable investigation uh, being undertaken, the contract's been awarded for that and it will commence in earnest in springtime when there's more favourable conditions for working at height. Um, what's obviously been previously mentioned is joints. The existing joints on the Fourth Road Bridge are over 50 years old and probably the oldest of their kind uh, in Europe. Uh, there's a tender currently out for that that's due back tomorrow and similarly that will commence in the new year. Um, and at the moment we're undertaking resurfacing and waterproofing trials on the Fourth Road Bridge itself together with our usual routine cyclic maintenance. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge investment. So there's program. a fair bit going on. So how, what, what lifespans left in the old bridge? Have we got a date for it? Would we actually have to finally close? Uh, I'm not aware of it ever having to finally <laughs> close, no. <laughs> no. I, 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 I'm not sure that that, that that is in the gift of anyone to say at this stage. But what, what would be very yeah. helpful, Michelle, and I think on, on, uh, with the point that's been made, that it'd be very helpful for the committee to have a list of ongoing works under the, the current mm -hmm. scheme. And considering the last questions, it, might, it would be very helpful, I believe, to the committee to have a list of ongoing proposed works to... Uh, the original bridge, as it were, um, to, so we have a schedule and, and we know what works are going to be undertaken. And I'm afraid, sadly, we're now out of time, so uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming today uh, and giving evidence to the committee, and I'd like to briefly suspend the meeting to allow the handover of witnesses. Thank you.
Thank you. I'd like to reconvene the meeting. The second item on the ag agenda is the implications of the outcome of the EU referendum for Scotland. And before we move into this session, I'd like to ask members to declare any interest they have in relation to this. And I would like to declare at the outset that I am a partner in a farm business. Would anyone else like to declare an interest? Stuart. Um, I have a small registered agricultural holding. Okay, Peter. I'm a partner in a, an agricultural <laughs> farming business in, uh, in Aberdeenshire. Okay, thank you. So the second evidence update in 2017 from the Scottish Ministers on the implications of the outcome of the EU referendum for Scotland. I'd like to welcome Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Mike Russell, the Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe. Uh, they are accompanied by David Barnes, the National Advisor on Agricultural Policy, Mike Palmer, the Deputy Director at Marine Scotland, and Ian Davidson, the Head of Constitution and UK Relations. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make a brief opening statement followed by, by the Minister, or if you want to do it the other way around, I'm relaxed. Thank Minister, you. Minister, would you like to make a brief opening statement? Very brief. Um, you will be aware, as members of this committee, the main features in uh, what are is a fast-moving Brexit landscape, I have to say. Uh, briefly, the first of which is a state of play in the EU-UK negotiations and the key question of whether or not the December Council can uh, assess that there has been sufficient progress to move from exit negotiations to framework negotiations. Uh, the is main issues at stake there are finance, the e position of EU citizens, the role of the European Court of Justice, and of course the Northern Irish border situation. I'm happy to reflect on any or all of those. And last week I was in London, Brussels, Dublin, and Belfast. So I, I have been briefed and have been discussing these issues. The second issue is the difficulty surrounding the withdrawal bill. Uh, this is about not just about devolution and devolved powers. It's about the way in which the Scottish government can approach Brexit and protect the interests of uh, Scottish citizens and Scottish businesses particularly. Both the Scottish and the Welsh governments have made clear they can't accept the bill as drafted. Negotiations continue, and indeed, Damien Green will be uh, in Edinburgh tomorrow meeting myself and the uh, Deputy First Minister, and I'm happy to update the committee on where those discussions have got to and what the issues are, including <coughs> the work on frameworks. Uh, and that's the third issue. We are uh, approaching the issue of frameworks pragmatically and responsibly. We're trying to find a way in which frameworks would work. And of course, we have said from the very beginning that we understand that frameworks should exist in some areas. But those frameworks have to be established uh, within the principles of devolution. Um, and they have to be able to work. They have to be able to deliver. And amongst the areas that we are looking at in our so-called deep dive exercise is the area of agriculture. Uh, Ian has just returned to the surface after another deep dive. And I'd be happy to update people about where that is and the progress that's being made. Those are the key issues for me, but of course I'll reflect on anything else that you ask me to. Um, but I would hope that I'm, sh I'm sure that Mr. Ewing will take the primary responsibility uh, for his subject area. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I'll be brief as, as well. The, the Scottish Government was never in favour of Brexit, as uh, members will know, but we are uh, making the best we can out of the situation that we're in, and to do so, we're taking advice from a, a wide range of people. Um, there and then, uh, members will be aware of uh, two recent documents relevant to today's session. On 17th of November, the Scottish Government's four agricultural champions published their interim discussion document for comments by the, the end of the year, convener, and today, the National Council of Rural Advisors has published its report on the impact of Brexit on the rural economy, and I believe that uh, efforts were made that members of this committee should receive an embargoed copy yesterday so that you'd have a, a chance for a quick examination of their interim report. These documents tend to confirm the government's own view of Brexit, that the threat to rural and coastal Scotland is huge, that the vast majority of people are very worried because of the huge uncertainties. For example, we still have no information whatsoever about the content of either the UK Fisheries Bill or the UK Agriculture Bill. I've been told today that the committee wants to focus on agriculture and fisheries uh, on the REC portfolio. For farming and the food supply chain, there has been regrettably very little progress on the main issues, namely future funding, workforce issues and future trade agreements. But I would also include forestry in this. 
the funding uncertainty in particular is having uh, a real-life impact on the, the sector. On fisheries, including both on and offshore, the key issues are the funding of the MF, workforce issues, future trade arrangements uh, for salmon and other seafood exports, and sea fisheries management in the Scottish zone. Now, if that sounds like a bit of a gloomy picture, it is, I believe, simply a reflection of uh, what I'm hearing, what people are saying, and what people are thinking in rural Scotland, in farming, fishing, and other parts of the rural economy. But, of course, I and my officials are happy to discuss all of these matters uh, with yourself and members of the committee convener this morning. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And at the outset, I, I would say there are a long list of questions um, which will not surprise either you or the Minister that, that there are so many. And therefore, I would encourage everyone to give as brief and succinct answers as possible to allow me to ensure that every person in the committee gets to ask the questions that they would like to. And on that note, I'd like to move to the first question, which will be asked by Richard Lyle. Good yes. morning, gentlemen. Um, you partly covered uh, what I was going to ask. But are you being updated on Brexit during the engagement you're having with the UK government? And are you discussing with other devolved administrations the process of leaving the EU? And what plans are there for future engagement, especially in respect to, as you covered, agriculture and fisheries? Yeah, we, um, I have regular dialogue with a, a, an enormous range of people. You know, it, my job is essentially in three parts. I, I undertake the negotiations within the UK. I work on potential solutions to the problems that we've got, and I meet with people. Uh, so I meet with the widest range of people. In terms of the uh, devolved administrations, I work very closely with Mark Drakeford, my Welsh counterpart. We had a, a meeting in Dublin on Friday morning. We both spoke at an event in London uh, last week. I meet with the UK government uh, regularly. Officials meet very regularly with UK government officials. But um, I last spoke to Damien Green, who chairs the JMC. We had a bilateral in Jersey uh, on the margins of the British Irish Council in Jersey uh, three weeks ago. And uh, you know, we would continue to have that. The JMC has started to meet again, which is very welcome. And I have paid tribute to Damien Green's role in that, in, in getting the process started on a slimmed down basis. I, uh, endeavour to have the widest contacts with people in Brussels, for example. Uh, European Parliament, I saw Danuta Hubner, one of the five members of the um, Brexit group in the European Parliament. I spoke on a platform with her last week, and I see her on a regular basis. I see other members of that group, uh, and I see other MEPs. I meet with commissioners, I meet with staff of the Commission and the Council, uh, and that is all on a regular basis. And we keep close contacts with others who are involved in this. I mean, clearly at British Irish Council, there will be conversations with the Irish government and with the uh, uh, Crown dependencies. And um, in Northern Ireland, which is more difficult, given the lack of an administration, then we have, uh, you know, our contacts have been built up over a long period of time. I had hoped to see the DUP this weekend, but it was their conference, but I will see, I hope, the DUP before the end of the year. I did meet uh, the, uh, somebody from the EUP, somebody from the SDLP in the last week or so, and I would keep a dialogue going and, and try and understand, and somebody from Sinn Féin, and I would keep that dialogue going. Just quickly, uh, what, what's your view on the hard border for, uh, between Northern Ireland and uh, 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 Ireland? We wouldn't want to do anything that makes that more difficult. But quite clearly, this is a, a crucial issue now. I mean, last week, this was being discussed very openly and very fully within Brussels. Two or three weeks ago, it was hardly being mentioned. Uh, it is essential that there is no hard border. That is vital in terms of trade. But it's also really important in terms of the stability of the Northern Irish peace process and the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and you know, our view very much is that they're required to find a solution, uh, but it's very difficult to find if they are also to the blunt, <coughs> if the Conservatives are in hock to the DUP, and the DUP don't want the solution that is being proposed by the Irish government. So there needs to be continued dialogue and debate, but this should not be diminished as, as, a, as an issue. Uh, and I think the language that is being used on this and the rhetoric, particularly from some parts of the Brexiteer um, press, is very damaging indeed and there needs to be a much more sober assessment of, of what can take, be taken forward. There is a frustration, uh, which one, is very obvious in the Irish government, that they have not been listened to on these issues, and that there, is, there tends to be a view that the British government uh, comes to the table with no solutions, having created the problem. So there needs to be a negotiation, there needs to be a solution, but there cannot be a hard border. Now, the obvious solution to this 
is the, the solution that the Scottish Government has espoused for Scotland and indeed for the whole of the UK, which is to remain within the customs union and preferably the single market as well. It is that uh, context that could change this. It, all, it changes negotiations because negotiations become about single market minus essentially and it changes it in terms of the dynamic in Ireland because if there is a customs union <coughs> then this problem disappears. Uh, but that customs union has to be more widely than Ireland if the, the border issue is not to be a, a, a great one. So I think that is where the solution lies and I'd continue to espouse it. It's been our position for a year. Thank you. Secretary, can I bring you in because you wanted to answer that and then I'd like to go to Mike Rumbles. Yes, thank, thank you. Uh, Convener, in terms of engagement at the start of the year, uh, DEFRA and the devolved administrations agreed to set up five official level working groups. These were food and farming, marine and fisheries, animal and plant health, environment and legislative issues. Um, in April, it was agreed to form two additional groups, making seven in all, trade, which was requested by Northern Ireland, and forestry, which was requested by myself and the part of the Scottish Government. Uh, and it was agreed that those two additional groups, working groups, be set up. Um, the working groups uh, have each made their own decisions on how often they meet, and they report to a senior officials group, which meets regularly, most recently last Friday. It was also agreed that four-way ministerial meetings, convener, would take place every month, but since the start of the year, there have only been four. In February here in Edinburgh, that was uh, with Andrea Leadsom, in April, September and November, uh, DEFRA did unilaterally cancel meetings in January, May and June due to, the, due to the UK general election and then in July. The next ministerial meeting is, is scheduled for the 14th of, of uh, uh, December. Um, my approach to, these, uh, to participation in uh, the ministerial meeting is to be, uh, to be constructive, uh, to be cooperative, to discuss, to debate, but not to be dictated to not to be dictated to, and thus far there is no evidence that there is a proper sharing of information. For example, when I asked Michael Gove would he share the Agriculture and Fisheries Bill, the answer was no. Abrupt, short and wholly unsatisfactory. But uh, let us hope that perhaps uh, with the new year a new leaf may be turned. Mike Rumbles. Thanks, Convener. Good morning. I've been advocating for almost 18 months that Scottish ministers should have taken the initiative and designed a new bespoke system of agricultural support for when we leave the EU by getting all our stakeholders, as the producers, environmentalists and consumers together to agree a way forward for Scotland. It now looks like this opportunity is being missed, as ministers are now talking about, that's Scottish ministers and UK ministers, about working within an agreed UK framework. So my question is, why are Scottish ministers not working on designing a bespoke system of agricultural support for Scotland that will feed into this UK framework? Are we just going to implement the common agricultural policy as we inherited it? Why are we missing such a marvellous opportunity in some respect to design our own bespoke system for Scotland? Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I think that falls to you to answer Well, that. not for the first time, I must respectfully disagree with everything that Mike mm -hmm. Rumbles has just said. Um, firstly, uh, we believe that it's essential that Scotland should retain in the single market. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, we think that the damage that would be wreaked by ending the free movement of people in the agriculture and rural sectors is, is uh, so catastrophic uh, to see uh, that, quite frankly, I, I, I'm astonished that Mike Rumble suggests that our attention <laughs> should be devoted uh, to producing a new policy when we have no idea of what the Brexit deal is going to be. Uh, I would have thought that, logically, the, the thing that we should be concentrating on, which uh, my colleague Mr Russell is concentrating on, is to try to snatch some crumbs of comfort from the jaws of a catastrophe, uh, and that is what we are doing to try to get the best result from Brexit. But we have, and Mr Rumbles knows this, a, of course taken steps to pursue a parallel approach of getting advice from experts. I already referred to the agricultural champions. Their interim report has been available for a while now, and I, I commend them for it. The National Council of Rural Advisors interim report is also available in pretty quick time. These, incidentally, in the latter one, was a report which Parliament uh, asked that I obtained, and I did exactly what Parliament asked, and more quickly, perhaps. Now, these reports will inform our future progress. Uh, we must get the best deal for Scotland, and if we are pulled out of the single market, 
if we can't continue to enjoy the fruits of the labours of people who choose to work in Scotland from all over uh, the European continent, uh, then there are very, very serious problems facing the sector. First of all, we need to ameliorate, mitigate the potential disaster of Brexit, and then, uh, once we see what the outcome is, of course, uh, we can then focus, but only then, I would submit, focus on uh, how best to go forward. But uh, Mr Rumbles is completely wrong. We have done exactly what uh, even he asked for, uh, and I'm surprised that uh, he's perhaps not showing a little bit of gratitude for that this morning. Um, now, can I just say that uh, uh, that was a particularly long answer, and, and I know I did make the point at the beginning that well, I'm necessary. having difficult to get everyone... Well, Cabinet Secretary, sorry... I, I don't think actually coming back with comments are helpful. I'm asking everyone to keep their comments short. Minister, you would like to add something, and then I'd like to briefly go back to Mike Rumbles before moving on to the next question. It's a very brief point, but simply to point out that item one on the list of 111 items, which the UK government intended to reserve to themselves, uh, having transferred back from Europe, was agricultural support. So clearly it is absolutely essential that we take part in discussions with the UK to ensure that that does not happen, uh, but if it, it does turn out to be in an agreed framework, then it will be on the basis of co-decision making, so that will be a positive step forward. Uh, Mr Rumbles, a Thank short you. question. You, I think I'd like to follow up with that. Um, as the Cabinet Minister knows, it was my amendment in Parliament that he accepted, and I knew what I meant by that amendment, I and mean, I think the Minister has misinterpreted it yet again. This issue of the Council for Rural Environment is not what we were calling for. This is an opportunity for Scotland to have developed its own distinct, individual, bespoke system of agricultural support, which is not just inherited, that, a system that was designed for countries on the mainland of Europe. Now, as far as I can see, nothing is being done <clears throat> by Scottish ministers to design this bespoke system. Is that true or not? Uh, well, it, no, it's not true. Uh, we have obtained the advice we have in order to uh, prepare uh, as best we can. But, of course, we just do not have the information now to <laughs> provide a new policy because, well, Mr Rumbles is laughing, but uh, how can you... Sorry, I'm just stop this now. I think, I think it's courtesy to both sides is, is when people are talking to listen to what's being said. And, and you, you might feel frustrated, Mr Rumbles, but please could you keep your comments to yourself to allow the Cabinet Secretary to answer. And please, when people are talking, could you not try and have the final word over what people are saying? So I'm going to go back to the Cabinet Secretary to ask him to make a succinct answer to that before I move on to the next question. Cabinet Secretary. Rural Scotland, under its membership of the EU for decades, enjoys relatively, relative certainty about continuance of funding in programmes which lasted around seven, seven years. Uh, currently, rural Scotland enjoys uh, financial support from Europe, uh, covering a whole, a whole range of issues, totalling around £500 million a year. I have repeatedly made clear that until such time as we have clarity from the UK Government as to what post-Brexit that funding would be replaced with, it is simply impossible by definition to prepare the sort of plan which Mr Rumbles thinks that we should produce. And I have uh, asked Mr Gove repeatedly if he would indicate what his UK government's plans are for funding post-Brexit. And I have also reminded him, I hope courteously, uh, that prior to Brexit, prior to the referendum, he said, and his colleagues on the Brexit side said, that EU funding would be matched. In fact, some of them said that it would be at least matched, implying that there would be more funding following Brexit. Now, I think it's a reasonable point to say that until we have clarity about the post-Brexit funding, and actually some of the pre-Brexit funding is by no means absolutely certain, then it is simply impossible to produce the kind of plan that uh, Mr Rumbles asked me to do. So uh, I hope that, that uh, he's happy with that answer. OK. Mr. M I want to record, if I may... I, I think not. people have record, uh, noted that you're not happy with that answer. Now, Mr Chapman, could I ask you to ask the next question? Yeah, well, I've got a very specific question to Mr Russell. And in your opening statement, Minister, you said that on issues related to UK frameworks, you were negotiating pragmatically and responsibly, and that was the words that you used. 
Now, Mr Gove told the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee in November that the Scottish Government had instructed its officials not to engage on issues related to UK frameworks. Is this a correct statement? And if so, why? No, it's not. So, why would Mr Gove make a statement like that if, if there's oh, no, no... I couldn't possibly put myself into Mr Gove's mind, um, nor would I wish to. Uh, <coughs> the reality of the situation is that we are engaged, and I think the words pragmatically and responsibly were actually used by Fergus Ewing, but I, I don't uh, resile from them. We're engaged in a difficult exercise, which is to build trust on both sides mm -hmm. to try and get these frameworks to operate. That is a careful and responsible activity. And step by step, we're doing so. And we're doing so, and I pay tribute to him, with the assistance of uh, Damien Green as the First Secretary of State, who's, who, having taken over the uh, chair of the um, Joint Ministerial Committee, has been very constructive. So step by step, we're trying to create those frameworks. What does not help is either Mr Gove or Ian Duncan, who has repeated that remark, uh, making remarks about Scottish, office, uh, Scottish government officials which are simply not true. The reality is that there have been endless discussions. Uh, Ian is just back from a discussion. Uh, officials from the, 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 the Fergus Ewing's department are endlessly involved in discussions. What we won't be is bounced uh, into agreements that Mr Gove wishes to reach for his own purposes. Mr Gove, for example, presented to the last meeting of the uh, ministers, the agricultural ministers, what he imagined should be in the frameworks. He had no responsibility for that and no authority to do so. That matter was being dealt with through the Joint Ministerial Committee, quite rightly, uh, and being dealt with by the agreement of both the Prime Minister and the First Minister that it should be done in that way. So whatever Mr Gove's motivations or Ian Duncan's motivations are, we are endeavouring to get a deal. We are working hard on a deal. We are doing so in a professional and responsible manner, and I think that should be respected by all parties. Just, just you said you wanted to add a, a short comment to that. Well, just two, two points. Firstly, Mr Gove is on record as saying on the 13th of September to the EFRA Select Committee, um, he said, I must say that the Scottish Government officials have been working very collaboratively with DEFRA officials. Uh, so I, I just uh, repeat that quotation. Uh, secondly, I do know that Mr Barnes, as, uh, as Mike Russell has just referred to, has been taking part in numerous uh, of these discussions with officials and, and he would be, I'm sure, happy to provide uh, details if members wish to ask. Uh, so we have been, if there is time convener, it's up to you, but we have been uh, discussing, debating constructively, but we will not be dictated to in a power grab uh, and uh, I hope that all members would agree that that's the correct approach. <laughs> I'm afraid, Cabinet Secretary, uh, that time is limited, as you pointed out. So I'm going to take the next question to John Mason and then come to Stuart Stevenson. So, hey, John. Thanks, Convener. The European Union withdrawal bill has been mentioned already, and so I just wonder if you can give us an indication <coughs> about what you're still concerned about within the bill. Um, have you got less concerns now because you've had some discussions and there seems to have been some movement? Uh, and, and, I mean, would it be the case, are you wanting more detail in the bill? Is it that you disagree with the detail that is in the bill already, or should some stuff just not be in the bill at all and left to other, other ways of dealing with them? Minister, Minister would you like to leave Yeah, the that? position is very clear. There are things in the bill that neither we nor the Welsh Government can accept, and principally Clause 11 in the bill, which uh, takes European competences and returns those to the UK without any involvement of the devolved administrations for decisions then by uh, the UK Government. Now, to be fair, the Secretary of State for Scotland has already indicated that he thinks all these things should be done by agreement. So that's the principle. Uh, there's also the principle of uh, secondary, uh, UK ministers being able to alter legislation without involving the Scottish Parliament or Scottish Ministers. So those are two key issues. So we can't accept either of those. Uh, yeah, that's not to say the rest of the bill is acceptable to us, but those are the issues which the two devolved administrations are taking up responsibly compared to the issues <coughs> that others will take up, which are wider issues. We are in the process of trying to have Clause 11 removed from the bill. It's not acceptable within the bill, uh, and the amendments we put forward would cure that problem. Uh, if there are other amendments, I've just been appearing this morning before the Finance and Constitution Committee, glutton for punishment that I am, and um, we've made it clear, I've made it clear that if there are alternative approaches in the UK government, we're of course willing to discuss them. And officials have been meeting to, to look at these, and it's been part of our discussion in the, <coughs> in the JMC. 
very briefly, convener, let me just, very briefly, there are five stages we're going through. First stage is to agree the principles on which frameworks should be established. We've managed to do that. Those principles were published as an annex to the communique of the um, Joint Ministerial Committee on the 16th of October. Second one is to start the deep dive process proposed by us uh, to see if we could have proof of concept. Would these work? And the examples we've used are agriculture, uh, uh, legal, uh, some justice legal matters, justice and home affairs matters, and a health, uh, health issues. The th we've done that. That's gone well. The third part is to see what governance and dispute resolution mechanisms could be put in place. That is underway and, and is progressing. The fourth stage is to bring that together in a political agreement that we can actually make this work. At the same time, to pare down the list of 111, to throw out the ones that are not necessary. And Adam Tompkins, for example, has indicated in a piece in the Scotsman some weeks ago, there are those items on the list. He used aircraft noise as an example, which don't need to be there, that can go, without conceding the principle that there should be no alteration to the basics of the devolved settlement. And the final item is to take all those things and to put those into legislation so that we can actually change the withdrawal bill and be prepared for future legislation. Now, we're, <coughs> we're, th we're, we're almost three, three parts out of five into that. We're still talking. Another meeting tomorrow with Damien Green, uh, Joint Ministerial Committee on the 12th of <coughs> December. We're making progress. But nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So we have to make sure that we work our way through that and get to a conclusion. Uh, and that is best done by this negotiating process rather than freelancing by Ian Duncan or Michael Gove. Um, John, John, I'd like you to come back in with a follow-up question, then I'd like to bring the Cabinet Secretary in well, to Well, I think to my, my follow-up okay. may actually go to the Cabinet Secretary, okay. but I'll Thank just you. ask it anyway, and it's, it's up to them. Um, so if we take something like the Common Agricultural Policy, I understand we're getting 16% of the UK funding at the moment. Now, I'm, I'm, would I be right in saying that, I mean, if the UK is going to control more of it, the hope would be that we would continue getting that 16%. If they just gave us 8.3% in line with our um, in. Uh, population, we might have complete control, but we'd have less money. So is there a kind of money v well, control thing? They, 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 this, cannot, this process cannot be completed without discussing and making sure that resources are secure. Right? So, for example, if there is to be a framework on agriculture, and that's probably <laughs> the most complex of the frameworks, fisheries may also be in there. Uh, environment will be part of it. But that money has to be part of that overall solution. And if there is a quantum now, then that quantum has to be included in those discussions. So that's there. And you know, I do this very much in cooperation with, with cabinet secretaries who are involved in these processes. They stress with me what is important to them. And I have to say that Fergus Ewing stressed with me at the very, <coughs> very beginning that in this process, the financial issue would be absolutely crucial. Cabinet secretary, would you? Uh, well, there's, there's kind of two overarching concerns. Firstly, is freedom of policy choice. Um, I mean, I think it's no secret that the main two parties in the UK have for some time uh, been seeking to phase out uh, direct farm payments, Pillar 1 support. Um, Scotland's position is entirely different. We have 85% of our land is LFAS. It's out of the border, it's 15, and they don't have LFAS scheme anymore. Uh, so it's plain that what has been in our interest is most certainly not down, down the case down south. Um, and indeed, where... Um, the policy that the, the main parties down south appear to prefer imposed in Scotland, I, I do believe quite profoundly it would have catastrophic consequences, especially for hill farming, with land abandonment, uh, with, uh, a, with depopulation, and with potential bankruptcies, and with thousands of farmers going out of business. So that's number one. We must have the freedom of policy choice a, a, in terms of uh, a, any future uh, proposed framework. Um, and on fisheries, the, the issue of discards is another example where there's plainly different views, where Michael Gove appears to prefer restriction of effort tying up boats, and uh, we do not prefer that at all. So there's a different view. As I've given examples of two areas where there's different approaches, different views, which is why there must not be a power grab and full devolution on funding. Uh, and this is a separate issue from the bill, but it's absolutely key. And the UK funding promises are incomplete because... The guarantee up to 222 is only limited to farm support, the definition of which has not, uh, has not been uh, a clarified, and they only last until the farmers 221 SAF form. So the, I've just finished this, the last sentence really is that promises that were made in the EU referendum to match funding post-Brexit were made by ministers, and ministers, if they make promises, must deliver them uh, or cease to be ministers. So I'm calling on Mr Gove 
to do what he said he would do during the Brexit referendum and make clear his plans for future funding on a, a long-term basis, as of course is the EU practice. Stuart, yours is the next question. Uh, thank you very much. I want to just develop a bit more about uh, how we go about developing shared frameworks across the UK uh, and the effect. In particular, um, what role there might be for stake our stakeholders and for the Scottish Parliament. But let me start, uh, I think Mr Russell said, if alternative UK government proposals are around. I'm given to understand in uh, rural policy area that uh, officials at UK government level have four different versions of secondary legislation uh, they may bring forward, depending on what they end up negotiating with the EU. And clearly that fundamentally is important to our understanding of where we go and how we can contribute. But I'm also told that uh, officials at the UK level have been told not to share these uh, drafts uh, with Scottish officials so that we can't know what the policy considerations are. First of all, is that actually the correct statement? And of course, my information may be imperfect, so I'm quite prepared to hear that I should be corrected in some parts of it. Minister, is that you to start that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't confirm whether or not that is true. I mean, uh, they don't share that information even with us, uh, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there were a range of drafts at this stage. One of the problems in this, system, in this whole relationship has been getting early access <coughs> to information. Uh, Fergus Ewing referred to the agriculture bill, you know, the e-withdrawal bill. I first asked to see that in January of this year at the plenary, the JMC plenary in Cardiff, I directly asked the Prime Minister for it. We didn't see that bill until I think the, first of, the 30th of June or 1st of July, two weeks before it was due to be published, uh, and immediately we knew we couldn't support it. So <coughs> early information sharing would be helpful. The 18 papers that the UK government has published in negotiations so far, we've only seen just before they were published uh, and without any possibility of input. But w w let's try and, you know, uh, fare forward rather than backward. You know, our view on this is very simple. If we are involved in this discussion, we will endeavour to come to a conclusion. Uh, we will endeavour to ensure that we get an agreement on this, but it must be a comprehensive agreement and it must take account of all the parts that are involved. That includes money, but it also includes an agreement on future legislation. If we can secure agreement on the EU withdrawal bill, which is a sort of gatekeeper bill for the bills that are to come, agriculture, fisheries, environment, uh, trade, all those bills, if we can do that, then we would be in a position to have an easier process in terms of reaching legislative consent. That's not to say we'll agree with the bills, but on the issue of achieving legislative consent, that will be easier. And that's because we make a distinction uh, it, between policy. We don't agree with this policy. We think it's daft, you know, but and technicality. And we recognise arrangements have to be put in place for the eventuality. So we're trying to do that. And actually on that one, my colleague Mark Drakeford is, is, very, is always very articulate on that one, to say it would be better not to have had this fight. In fact, this was an unnecessary fight. We could have agreed on how this bill should be put together, which is a practice on all bills that require legislative consent up until now. There would have been early negotiation discussion. There wasn't. This is a consequence. So the earlier discussion takes place, the better that discussion is, the more likely it is we can make progress. On technicality in particular, where a lot of the implementation of the shared <coughs> frameworks and other matters uh, will be through secondary legislation at Westminster, it appears, um, is there a particular threat to the interests of devolved nations uh, in the absence of a formal process of review and consideration at Westminster for secondary legislation? No equivalent no, that, creates, that creates two, two questions. Uh, the first of which is, should UK ministers be able to bring forward yep. such legislation without consultation of Scottish ministers and Scottish Parliament? The answer is no. Uh, you know, that is, the exercise of the Henry VIII powers, for example, should not be uh, permitted to be exercised in ways that run contrary to the interests of this Parliament. Uh, I think there are many MPs at Westminster who believe that. Lib Dems have been involved in attempting to amend the bill. Uh, you know, we support those amendments because because of the right thing to do. The second question, just in terms of the, the complexity of that secondary legislation, is should there be a process here 
that would require that would look at uh, that type of scrutiny uh, and legislative consent process for secondary legislation. Well, the Secretary of State for Scotland has indicated that process should exist. It exists in Wales, of course, given the difference of their, their devolved settlement. So it may well be that one of the changes to devolution that this process produces would be a legislative consent but, process but for secondary legislation. Minister, just briefly. Um, can I just take you back, though? We are now deep diving into the technicalities of this. No, but, but, <coughs> but there are some important things derived from technicalities. That there is no pro process mm -hmm. at Westminster no. for parliamentary scrutiny of much of the secondary legislation, unlike in the devolved administrations. So are there particular threats if Westminster uses secondary legislation to put frameworks into effect? even without Westminster parliamentary scrutiny? It, 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 absolutely. <coughs> there are particular threats in the secondary legislation process, even without Brexit, I should say. You know, even without Brexit, there are inadequacies in that process. Brexit emphasises <coughs> it. It's a, sort of, you know, it, it's a, a magnifying glass on those weaknesses and inadequacies, but it also produces additional ones, is the point I'm making, in terms of the Henry VIII powers and in terms of the issue of legislative consent to secondary legislation both of which are under discussion, uh, and you know, both of which I think will uh, need to be resolved. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I'm, I'm, I'm just mindful of the time in the sense that we've, we've sure. got 24 questions or so, it's just, uh, and two, we're on number four. Really, it's just to, to repeat what I've said to many key stakeholders, right. uh, including obviously the NFUS and others with whom we work very closely, that these uh, seven working groups to which I referred are considering their issues, and I would exhort all the main stakeholders in Scotland to contribute uh, to the work of those, those committees because if they make written submissions, for example, we will guarantee that their views are fully considered. Okay, thank you. The next question is Jamie Green. Uh, thank you um, and good uh, morning, uh, panel. Uh, it's likely that after March uh, 2019, we will move into some form of implementation or transition period. I just want to know what the Scottish Government's view on whether the UK should uh, remain part of uh, CFP or indeed CAP during that transition period, or indeed it, 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 the expectation is, as some have said, that we should leave on the day of exit. Minister, well, do you want to...? I wonder if I could answer that, because I've recently been discussing transition okay. um, uh, you know, with a range of, of people. I, I think that the question is a false premise. If transition is to take place, there is no doubt in the minds of, uh, of the uh, EU 27 that transition means a continuation of the acquis. There, there isn't any op other option. In those circumstances, it is not possible to say we will leave this part, but not that part. It is like the, um, the, the, the discussion that apparently the UK Cabinet ha had last week about tapering off the jurisdiction of the ECJ. You know, jurisdiction is a light bulb, it's on or off, you can't taper it off. So it is not possible, if there is to be transition on the basis of continuation, that there would be a leaving of anything on the 29th of March. Uh, but it is obvious that in areas such as agriculture and fisheries where there are annual negotiations, that it would be difficult if there was no annual negotiation. So I think that there is a recognition that I hear uh, from, from other countries that there would need to be some arrangements made. But to assert that we will leave these things on the 29th of March would jeopardize the Prime Minister's stated intention to have a two-year transition period because it's not pick and mix. And indeed, this was being said, I heard this <coughs> being said in April in, in, in Brussels, that if there was to be transition, or as the Prime Minister chooses to call it, implementation, uh, then that is a continuation uh, because there is no third state that you can move to. Uh, so I think the question is a false premise. In terms of remaining in things, I'm keen that we remain in the EU, and therefore there needs to be a discussion about how those affect things. Now, the common agricultural policy can be developed and changed. I have made no secret, as many have, of the fact that we don't think the CFP works for anybody, and therefore there need to be major changes to the CFP. But let's understand what transition is and what it isn't. Uh, Jamie, do you want to follow that up, or uh, uh, Cabinet uh, Secretary, uh, do you want Secretary to, wants to add anything further? Do you want to add anything? Mr. Russell has uh, given a pretty copper plate answer. I would just add that you know you can't you can't be in and out of a club at the same time. Would be uh, to the comment around uh, participation in the CFP is is that whilst there may be uh, 
views on whether the current status quo works or doesn't. Um, wanting it to change is not the same as participating in the status quo. So, how, you know, do you see any benefits in exiting the CFP as it currently stands, notwithstanding any changes you want to see to in the future? I, I don't actually see any benefits in any, exiting the EU. There may be sectors, and fishing is a very rare sector, where there are people who believe there are enormous benefits. They don't all believe there are enormous benefits, of course. You know, in my own constituency, the, um, the shellfish sector you know, has separated itself from the SFF because of streaming concerns about the way in which the interests of shellfish and, and uh, of exporting have been ignored. So I think there are disputes on these issues. But, you know, uh, baby and bathwater spring to mind in these circumstances. We need to be very careful about where we are. But I think the important point, I just stress this with Mr. Green, it's very important. It is, it is a false prospectus to say that in a period of transition uh, or implementation, you can pick and choose uh, what you are doing. That will not be possible. And if that is what the UK government seek, it will not happen. Okay. Thank you. Uh, get Briefly, um, well, it, it's an important point as far as fishing is concerned. And you, you know, when we come out of the EU in March 2019, we will then have control of our, our 200 mile limit. I mean, international international law tells us that that is that is absolutely the consequence of becoming an, a, a, an independent fishery state, as we will then be. So there will be there will be huge changes <coughs> for the for the fishing industry. Uh, we can still live through a, a some sort of a Period, but but you know we will then take control out to 200 miles, and that that is uh, that is indisputable, I would argue. Well, it is not indisputable in terms of the Prime Minister's own statement. So I think Mr. Chapman might want to take it up with the Prime Minister. You cannot have transition uh, which departs from the acquis. So what will happen? You know, and it's axiomatic: is you will continue, uh, you know, there, not as a member, but observing the acquis in every regard. Now, there may be special arrangements made for, for negotiation on, on quota and, and, and a whole range of issues, but I think it's selling a false prospectus to say that you know, a bright new dawn will break on the 30th of March in which everything will be changed. Uh, there will be major disadvantages to every sector. I have no doubt about that, Mr Chapman, and I will disagree on that, no doubt. But there is no doubt also that transition means the status quo for a period of time. If it does not mean that, there will not be transition. So, you know, I agree with Mr. Chairman to the extent that if the UK government does not accept that and does not understand that, then something dramatic will happen on, at 11 p.m. on the 29th of March, dramatic in the sense of disastrous. The next question is from Gail Ross. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I want to concentrate on the UK Agricultural Bill and um, the 25-year environmental plan. Um, Two parts to this uh, first question. I think I probably know the answer to the first part, but I will ask you anyway. Has the Scottish Government been involved at all in the development of the 25-year environmental plan, the Agricultural Command Paper and the UK Agricultural Bill? And, um, Minister, you said that you were at the Finance and Constitution Committee just this morning, and we know that they're considering a legislative consent memorandum on the EU withdrawal bill. Do we know yet whether a similar procedure will be used for the Agriculture and Fisheries Bill at all? Can I deal with the, the first part? And uh, whilst Rosanna Cunningham is dealing with the environment uh, matter, I understand <coughs> that, that uh, there was no, uh, no consultation, none, with the devolved administration uh, in respect of the 25-year plans for the environment and food and farming. Um, recently, Mr Gove seems to have indicated there will not, in fact, be a 25-year plan for food and farming. Um, so we, we are, I am afraid, in, in the dark um, in relation to their plans. And, um, you know, I, I would give Mr Gove 100% for personal courtesy, but 0% for outcomes. We've had uh, a sprinkling of platitudes. Uh, we've had uh, fine sentiments being expressed. Uh, and we've even had uh, several quotations from fine English poetry. But none of that pays the bills. Minister, did you want to add something to that? Um, simply to say, in terms of legislative consent motions, I, I, we, our assumption is 
that are required to be legislative consent motions on all bills that have a, uh, a devolved element, and clearly agriculture will have a devolved element. So, uh, for example, the trade bill, we already know, will require a legislative consent motion, which, of course, we will not be willing to grant unless we can resolve the issues within that bill, which are broadly the same as the issues within the withdrawal bill. That is why I'm indicating the withdrawal bill and success in those negotiations is the gatekeeper to actually a process which will allow legislative consent elsewhere and might allow it within the agricultural bill. It's impossible to say because we haven't seen the bill. Do you know timescales for either of the bills? Everything at Westminster keeps slipping, uh, you know, even though the clock is ticking. Um, I think they're now talking about the agricultural bill in the spring, um, which was being talked about at, at some stage at the turn of the year, but it's not going to be. Fisheries bill roughly on the same. Um, time scale. So, but we, you know, the, the EU withdrawal bill now will not go to the Lords until February, late January, probably February. So, you know, everything's slipping. Yeah. And the Fisher's bill was supposed to be October, but it's now going to be, yeah, the consultation was supposed to be October, so uh, we, we are in the dark about that as well because it hasn't been issued. So, when it does happen, what plans have you got to engage with the UK government on? Both well, of these. We, we, we automatically engage on any such legislation. The best way to draw this legislation up, and I really want to stress this because I'm sure Fergus Ewing will agree, is to make sure there's early contact on the details of the bill. That's true of fishes, it's true of agriculture, it's true of trade. So that when the bill is developed, we are able to spot the difficulties and to say that won't work, but this will work. If they won't share legislation, which has always been the practice throughout devolution, you know, not, not simply when you know, there were administrations of the same political hue, mm. but in the last 10 years. Officials mm. will share the legislation in draft form. There will be a discussion about how it should proceed. That gets rid of the difficulties. But if they won't share this until they publish it, then quite clearly there will be problems. Cabinet Secretary, it's, uh, do you want to add to that? or are you? It's... Well, I'm just I'm absolutely <coughs> agree. It really is very frustrating. And, you know, if a relation, relationships, good relationships are based on trust, and trust implies a willingness to share under the usual rules of confidentiality uh, documents which are in draft form, whether they be bills or consultation papers, so that we can have a say, so that we can have an input. You know, if the UK maintains the position, as it appears to be adopting convener in this matter, that they will not share consultation documents, they will not share the agricultural bill, they will not share the fisheries bill, I'm afraid that's not consistent with the relationship based on trust. And, and I think uh, the farmers, fishermen out there want us to make progress and want us to have a kind of trusting relationship. In the forestry bill, which we consider next, next week, we're working quite well with the UK government. So it is equal, it's very frustrating because of that that they don't apply the same kind of approach towards the, the, uh, uh, the Brexit uh, uh, documents. Rada, yours is the next question. Thank you, Convener. Can I ask about the principles of agricultural policy going forward rather than the detail? Um, Michael Gove had agreed three principles um, for the future of agriculture. Um, provision of public goods, um, incentivising in innovation and helping with volatility. Do you agree with those principles? But Secretary, I think that's you. Um, well, I don't think I would express them quite in, in that way. Um, I mean, I, I think that, uh, that farmers should be... Uh, f my, my own view, which I've expressed several times this committee, is that the, the role farmers play should be respected and acknowledged better in producing high-quality food, but also as the custodians of the landscape. Uh, and they also have responsibilities to ensure diversity and, uh, and quality of water in terms of the environment. Uh, so I would put things quite diff a bit differently. But I guess my... my uh, and uh, I would incidentally really commend the committee members to the National Council of Rural Advisors' recommendations. They really do repay a close reading and to the agricultural champions who touch on all of this and set out potential approaches that we could take, a, a harking back to Mr Rumble's uh, a question. But the problem is that until we have a reasonable clarity about what future funding arrangements and what the powers we're going to have, it's not possible to embark upon the exercise of architecture, of redesign, because we won't know what powers we have and we have no idea, absolutely none whatsoever, about funding. So fine sentiments are okay, 
but without funding clarity, without clarity about this with, Parliament continuing respect, to enjoy full power Secretary. over agriculture and fisheries, it, you know, it's, it's really a bit of a theoretical exercise to set out a perfect set of principles. And Cabinet Secretary, I think I was clear at the start, I wasn't looking for detail, I was looking for the principles that will underpin your policy going forward. What are they? Well, I mean, I've already said it's not possible to set out uh, the principles until we know what powers we will have, whether we will continue to enjoy all powers over agriculture and fisheries that we currently have. Interestingly, and I, this Mr Barnes uh, shared this information with me, in the work that he has done uh, with DEFRA officials, with his, his counterparts, my understanding uh, is that there has not been identified in those discussions any matter in respect of agriculture uh, which would require to be reserved. In other words, uh, it appears, and I don't want to speak for the DEFRA officials, but what I'm being advised is that there's nothing to present, prevent the UK government from confirming right now that, that we will continue to enjoy in future all powers over agriculture, including uh, those which have rested with the EU. So uh, it would be extremely helpful because I'd be delighted and keen indeed to, to, uh, to, to look at the way forward. Uh, it would be very helpful though to enable me to do that if Mr Gove can provide the clarity which his officials appear to be providing to ours. Can, can, I, can, can I just say that uh, we, I just want to reiterate this. We're less than halfway through on the questions and we're more than halfway through on the time. So the shorter you could, you could make your answers. And I would urge not only uh, members of the committee, but also those people giving evidence to look occasionally at me. I will try and give you the nod if I think you're <coughs> needing to wind up so I don't have to cut you off, which I think would be rude. And I will try and avoid doing that. But Rhoda, could I ask you to continue the question? And I want to bring in Mr. Rumbles. Yeah. Um, I'm quite concerned because I've said twice I'm not looking for the detail, I'm looking for the vision where your priorities would lie and you can't answer that. So that's worrying to me. Um, it worries me especially because of the area of the country I cover, um, the highlands and islands which have done badly out of agricultural support in the past. And I would have hoped today that I could have gone away with some um, comfort for them that their needs would not be overlooked going forward. But actually, I have no comfort for anybody. You know, I, I, with respect, I do disagree with that characterization of my views. I mean, I've time and again set out principles. You've asked me to what brief. I, I can't go over the whole of the principles that we've set out in, in numerous uh, documents. I mean, for example, I would refer members back to the vision for agriculture, which we set out in 2015, which encompassed sustainability, education, food and drink, and public value. I would refer members to the, to the two really useful pieces of work from the Champions and the National uh, Council. These all help us to work together to formulate that vision across Parliament, and I think that's the best approach, and I will continue to follow it. Mike, you want to come in, and then I'm going to bring in I'm Peter. Trying to, trying to be constructive and helpful as ever. So what I was trying to say really, and I wonder if the ministers could respond to this, whatever happens I, either in the future we're going to have a continuation of some degree of the system that we have got for Scotland or we have an opportunity to design a new system and feed that up to the UK government. If we don't feed what we want in Scotland up to the UK government, we are likely to get into a situation where the UK government says this is what we've designed negotiate it with you. Is it not so much better to turn around and say, look, this is, this is what we want to do, and this is what we want to have in agricultural support, and try and get buy-in from everybody around that in a very positive way? Well, we are already taking that approach in the discussions that officials are, uh, are having. As I say, we, we are having discussions and debate, but we uh, believe we should not be dictated to, and clarity around powers and funding I think are sine qua nones. In a sense, convener, I mean, uh, I'm quite sure there will be a time for this discussion, but that time for this discussion about the way ahead is only after the basics have been clarified. And the trouble is they haven't. And I have to say that, that uh, the, the alarm, the anxiety amongst the farming community, and I recently visited a monitor farm last week and I spoke at AgriScot uh, as well last week, that the anxiety about farming, about just basically being able to get labor, getting Scotch lamb into the European markets, uh, having enough people to pick the tatties or the berries, uh, the fish sector, over half 
the people that work in the onshore processing sector are EU nationals. Now, I mean, until the UK provides clarity, a response, for example, to the NFU about a seasonal workers scheme, um, we are flying blind, we are in the dark, and we can come forward with a perfect policy, but quite frankly, it wouldn't really be relevant until such time as we get answers on the basics. Um, Mr Chapman. You know, I need to come back to you, Cabinet Secretary, but you've, you've continually been saying all, all forenoon that you, you have no idea on funding and you have no idea on power. You know, I, I, I would argue that that's not correct. There's still a debate to be had, I accept. But nevertheless, the, the, the message from Westminster, there will be no diminution of powers in this, in this Holyrood Parliament. And, there will, the, and on funding, Mr Gove has said, there will be the same level of funding going forward till 2022. So how can you possibly say that you've no idea on either of these things? I know there's bits to be argued about, but you can't sit there and say that you have no idea, because you have. Well, I've said quite clearly there's, there's, by definition, no idea whatsoever post-Brexit about what the funding will be. And the promises were made that after Brexit, the funding would be at least the same. So there's been no opinion whatsoever expressed about post-Brexit at all, despite the fact that uh, it's uh, pretty close upon us. So far as the interim steps go and the assurances that have been given, and such assurances that have been given are welcome, uh, obviously. They only apply to farm support. They do not apply to those pillar two aspects of funding that do not fall within the definition of farm support. That's a technicality, but it's a very, very important one, you know, for Horizon, uh, for LEADER, for the regional fund, for the social fund, for research, for community development, uh, a, for a whole host of things. So there hasn't been, I'm afraid, Mr Chapman, a, a sufficient, a, there hasn't been a sufficient level of assurance up to Brexit and post-Brexit uh, we're completely flying blind. The next question, Cabinet Secretary, comes, comes from me. Um, first of all, I think all of Parliament will have welcomed the review that was announced of the convergence payments. Uh, could I just ask you what timescale and what process you believe should, be, should form part of that review? And, and a, a, a short answer would be, would be appreciated. Uh, well, the, the review that was promised was promised some years ago, so I'm pleased that, belatedly, the UK government has now recognised that their previous promise must now be implemented. I discussed this with Mr Gove at a meeting uh, a, a few weeks back, uh, and uh, we agreed between us that prior to Christmas uh, we should settle the remit, uh, we should settle the identity of the person or people who conduct the review, uh, and also, I think we wish to set the timescale within which the review uh, should, be, should be completed. Um, and uh, I am, uh, have put forward proposals to Mr Gove, uh, uh, which I believe are, are um, sensible uh, and reasonable. And I'm, I was very pleased that he said that he would, would uh, work with us in order to settle this matter by Christmas. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, if, if, if there is a good result, which one, one hopes for Scottish farming there is, that the convergent payments are made available to Scotland, is the Scottish Government in a position to ensure that all those people who should have received convergence payments receive the money, including those if it's backdated? That's the first question. Well, I very much hope that the review will find that money that was intended for Scottish farmers and Scotland's rural communities um, should go to those communities. That is the clear objective that the Scottish Government has, and I hope we are in the position to implement that. Uh, plainly, that money was intended to be paid in annual payments in respect of the whole of the period from 2014 to, I think, 2021. Uh, that was the plan originally. The fact that that plan was subverted by the UK Government, in, in my view, uh, wrongfully appropriating that money and using it for other purposes, may cause difficulties in terms of technicalities, uh, and these are matters that will require to be looked to. But as Cabinet Secretary, in conclusion, you know, I'm determined to make sure that those who are entitled to the money get the money. I, I think farmers would welcome the fact that there'd be no intention to siphon any money off uh, for other purposes. And my final comment on it is, or question on it, is do you think that review of the convergence payments will affect agricultural support budgets post-Brexit? Well, I think that, that I, I think it's agreed that the review should have two components. Um, one, the, the, what's happened in the past, and two, looking to the future. So yes, I, I think that the review should 
uh, look at the fundamental issues about uh, the way in which funding is distributed in the UK uh, and reflecting the fact that uh, Scottish farmers, as I understand it in 2019, will actually receive the lowest payments per hectare of any of the EU states, or just about that, that, that case. So Scottish farmers have been receiving less per hectare than elsewhere in the UK, and therefore the review, I think, should look at that uh, aspect as well. And I believe that, in principle, that's accepted by Mr Gove, and uh, as soon as we have uh, clarity on, on these matters, I will come back to, to this committee. I undertake that. Okay. Uh, John Finney, the next question is yours. Uh, thank you, Camina. Uh, good, good morning, panel. Um, panel, the, the Scottish Government's commissioned research on EU workers in the various sectors. Are you able to outline what that research has shown, please, and what the Scottish Government uh, can do uh, for those who rely on seasonal non-UK workers post-Brexit, please? Um, yes, a research project entitled Farm Workers in Scottish Agriculture is currently being undertaken by a team of researchers at SRUC. Um, I can inform Mr Finney that field work has been completed and analysis of the data is ongoing and findings will be presented by the research team at the Rural Cross Party meeting on the uh, Tuesday the 5th of December and final publication of that uh, SRUC report is expected uh, er early next year. I expect that it will echo the concerns of, that's been expressed to me recently in meeting with fruit farmers, for example, with those who work in abattoirs where 95% of the, of the veterinary, the OVs, the, the veterinary supervising officers, highly qualified people come from EU states. Uh, and uh, as I say, in fish processing and tourism, I think there is a serious concern that many businesses in rural Scotland would be unviable without the, without the continued work of people from the EU who choose to come and work here. And that choice is one that we should be grateful for and thank and appreciate and welcome. Uh, so I think the SRUC report will play a, a useful role in informing the debate going forward. Thank you. Uh, Fulton, the next question is yours. Thanks, convener, and thanks, panel. Um, this committee and other committees and across the parliament as, whole, uh, as a whole have heard evidence after evidence about various industries and sectors who are very worried about uh, Brexit and the impact on uh, EU labour. Have you any idea how the various sectors might, be, might retain um, access to this labour after Brexit? Well, free movement of... Uh, on that, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'll, I'll be brief and pass to Mr Russell, but I mean, plainly, you know, one of the, the benefits of the EU has been free movement of people. It's uh, been great for people who can choose which country to work in and personal freedom and to enjoy that. It's something that we perhaps don't recognise enough. Um, uh, and it's been great for Scotland to have the benefit of, of that work here. And I don't really think there's any parts of the rural economy that would be unaffected uh, by this. And therefore, you know, I, I do hope, and I, th I think this is a hope really shared by everybody of whatever political persuasion, I do hope that we can get some early clarity from the UK governments Recommendations have been put forward by the NFUS of a, a seasonal worker scheme, uh, certainly worthy of consideration. Um, but I do hope, above all, that an early decision is made by uh, the, the UK on this, because these people are absolutely essential to the economy and the communities in rural Scotland. I would refer the, the member particularly to the evidence that the Scottish Government uh, submitted to the Migration Advisory Committee uh, to two and a half weeks ago. My colleague, Dr. Alistair Allen, has been leading on that. That shows the dependence of the Scottish economy <coughs> on inward migration, which is pretty substantial. Scotland, there, there's no regeneration, natural regeneration of population in Scotland, uh, unlike south of the border where about 40% of population growth comes from regeneration. It doesn't happen here. So uh, unless we have people coming in, then the population uh, becomes static and then begins to decline. Uh, and in, it is quite stark in rural areas. Uh, I think Rhoda Grant will know that at the last Highlands and Islands Convention, the leader of Highland Council, uh, and I think Gil Ross will know this too, uh, presented some evidence that showed that about 20% of the Highlands and Islands workforce was due to retire over the next uh, period. Uh, and that's about 80,000 people. And actually finding those 80,000 from natural uh, regeneration of population is literally impossible. 
So that, you know, we are looking at a continuing decline in the Highlands and Islands population. Now, somebody like myself who represents a, an extreme rural constituency in Argyll and Butte, that means continuation and accelerating depopulation, particularly in the most rural parts of the constituency. And that will have a huge effect on you know, agriculture, on aquaculture, on a whole range of activities. So we have to find a way to resolve that. And the only way to resolve it is free movement, in actual fact, because migration policy set up in a way, even the seasonal ag agricultural scheme, uh, will not do that. There will be in inhibitions to it. The British-Irish uh, Chambers of Commerce gave, uh, published a report on Monday, which would also, uh, people would benefit from reading it, where they indicate very sensible, very sane organisation, huge amount of work being done by them on a huge trade between the UK and Ireland, indicating that only uh, customs union and the single market arrangements will produce the conditions that allow that trade to continue. And these are not, you know, I mean, you know, I'm quite sure there are people in this um, uh, uh, committee who will dismiss, uh, you know, things that the Scottish Government says as, as the, the raving of mad gnats. These people are not mad gnats in any sense. These people are very sensible, uh, sober businessmen looking at it and coming to the inevitable conclusion that uh, exits from the EU will mean economic damage and particularly damage in terms of the accessibility of labour. And almost every sector in Scotland is now saying the same thing. It needs to be listened to. Fulton, do you want to follow up? Yeah, well, well actually, the, the Minister uh, touched on what my follow-up point was. I was going to ask specifically about agriculture and the uh, uh, agriculture wor um, workers, the seasonal uh, workers scheme being introduced. Your views on that? The seasonal workers scheme uh, you know, was, was, was much criticised while it was in, in, in operation. It produced a result. But the result was, was often focused on student labour. It was a short term, the, the actual short term nature of those who were coming was difficult. It, 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 agriculture, and particularly horticulture, has changed substantially since then. You know, there is a, an, almost a year round activity. Uh, the volumes are substantially greater. Uh, and it is unlikely to attract the type of people who presently come. Now, one of the reasons for that, of course, is a shortage of agricultural labour across Europe. You know, Germany has, has recently licensed the, uh, for, uh, I think, up to 10,000 Ukrainians to come in to work in agriculture because there is a shortage of agricultural labour. And what Scotland has particularly been able to attract is people who come for the longer term and, and quite often have other... Uh, uh, they may go home regularly, but they have other activities. <coughs> in Angus, for example, people who work in soft fruits may also work in fish factories and fish processing. So there is a dynamic uh, and a pattern of activity which this, you know, the, the removal of free movement will remove. And it is not at all clear where that will be substituted from. There aren't people in Scotland to substitute from that, nothing like as many. This is a dynamic labour force. How you get that from elsewhere becomes a moot point. And of course, the fall in the value of the currency, just to make this point convenient, it's quite important, has also meant that many people are not willing to come. You know, they, they just say to themselves, this is no longer as worth it as it has been. So this is bad news for rural Scotland. Cabinet Secretary, before we bring you in, uh, I know uh, the Deputy Convener has got a question which you may like to answer as well. Sorry, uh, Gail. Thank you, Convener. Um, just to touch on the interim report um, that was published this morning from the National Council of Rural Advisors, it comes with a number of recommendations. And, um, well, the very first one on page three is how we attract and retain homegrown talent. And you touched on that just now, Minister. Um, other things such as uh, base more businesses in rural areas. I mean, I would support that Brexit or no Brexit. Um, build on talent attraction work. How do you propose to take forward the recommendations in, these, in this paper? Uh, well, I, I was about to actually to, to quote from this particular section in response to the... the, the, the previous uh, a question and the, the National Council of Rural Advisors makes some <coughs> quite interesting points that I don't think we've heard in the debate before and I just wanted to share a couple of them briefly with you, Convener, that a smaller labour pool will increase competition and result in increased costs to business as wages rise and micro or family owned businesses that are so dominant in remote rural areas could find it difficult to compete with larger counterparts where there is a smaller pool of labour. Now, as Gail Ross says, the, the, uh, the National Council have produced a whole series of, of uh, recommended approaches under labour and skills, uh, trade uh, funding and legislation and standards, and they're all worth a, worthy of consideration. Um, but uh, this is an interim report, as is that of the champions. What we have said, and I repeat today, is that we will consider their advice as we consider advice from all sources, including 
stakeholders with whom we work closely. And in the spring, we hope to come to uh, a, 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 a view as to the best approaches to be followed, but to inform that approach by listening carefully to to uh, the advice that we've we've had, and certainly we should consider how we can attract and retain homegrown talent. Uh, we should promote rural areas as centres of excellence for non-traditional rural sectors. Uh, we should overcome connectivity barriers, whether they be physical or virtual. We should promote opportunities for people to work remotely and base more businesses in rural areas. Uh, we should introduce greater flexibility in immigration rules to recognise self-employed businesses in rural areas operated by uh, non-UK nationals provide essential services, and generally how we can ensure the necessary talent exists to continue the vibrancy of the rural economy in Scotland. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The next question is Richard Lau. Yes. Um, during the EU referendum, as already was said, fishermen were promised uh, we'll take back control of the seas come back to, to, to the UK and ever know be rosy in the garden or in the sea. Um, I believe they'll be sold out again. Michael Goh, in a reply to Baroness Wilcock, said on the 1st of November, it will probably not change dramatically the day after Brexit. So what's your view? How do you see the relationship between the UK and the European Union for fisheries post-Brexit? What would you like to see in the UK fisheries bill? When do you expect the bill, and do you think that fishermen will be sold out again? Uh, I think, Cabinet Secretary, the Minister's indicating that's for you to answer that. Sure. Um, well, uh, you know, upon leaving the EU, the UK will assume full control of the exclusive, exclusive economic uh, zone as a coastal state. That's in line with international law, with the, with the rights and responsibilities that that entails. And, you know, I think it's fair to say that across both governments there is an acceptance that fishing needs to be sustainable. It needs to be sustainable in the sense that stocks need to be measured by science. And then there must be an approach of conservation of those stocks and not overfishing. And the total allowable catch method of the EU, I think, is not only a sensible way to deal with that, but is also recognised as such, I think, by almost everybody uh, that's involved. So I, I think it's important to make that, that point to start off with. Um, there's no reason why future coastal status negotiations should be carried out exclusively by the UK government in future. Scotland is the lead in fishing in terms of the value, the contribution to the economy, uh, the, the wealth of our fishing grounds, and therefore we could and should, I think, be offered the opportunity to play the lead role in negotiations uh, within a UK coastal state model after Brexit. Um, after all, we should have that voice where our interests are at stake. And lastly, um, you know, I, I am looking forward to, but have not yet had, an answer to the question that I put to Mr. Goldford uh, and his uh, ministerial team, which is this. You know, can you confirm that they will not be bartered away to achieve other things in the EU Brexit negotiations, access to our exclusive economic zone? There has been no answer to that question, and I think there should be one. Just before I bring you back in, I'm going to bring Stuart in briefly and then come to you. So, Stuart. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned conservation, the need to manage stocks. Uh, given that the UK has been a signatory, a part of ISIS since <coughs> 1902, um, is it your expectation that the scientific environment which will uh, lead policy in this will uh, remain unchanged, whatever the future in relationship with the EU might be? Well, um, you know, it, 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 I, I cannot really speak for the UK government, nor I suspect would they wish me to. So I cannot say what their plans are, what's in their mind, what their views may be. But I did, I think, set out uh, briefly the principled approach that uh, we should take. Um, we will continue in ISIS. We expect that is the right approach. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I hope and expect that the UK would, generally speaking, follow follow that approach as in the interests of the environment and the long-term interests of, uh, of uh, the fishing sector too. Would you like to come in? Yeah, order to be brief, uh, fishermen's representative bodies seem to have a high expectation that access to UK waters will be managed in a radically different way post-Brexit. What's your view on this and what's your view on Scotland's exclusive economic zone? Well, obviously, we wish to see Scottish fishing succeed as best, uh, uh, as best it can, and indeed I was pleased to, to play a part in the December negotiations last year, which 
uh, achieved, I think, a very successful outcome, actually, for the fishing sector, something that was very much welcomed by the fishing representatives with whom I worked in Brussels last December. The same approach will be applied uh, again in this December in a couple of weeks' time, and indeed we have the opportunity to debate that in Parliament uh, traditionally before the Brexit negotiations to inform our approach to those negotiations. But, you know, the guiding principles will be sustainability and the setting of quotas in line with scientific advice. Uh, and uh, whilst our relationship with the EU may change, our commitment to working with other European nations to achieve the best uh, outcomes uh, will not. Thank you. Uh, Peter, do you want to follow up on that just, for your next question? Just to follow up on that, I mean, you, you know, the, the, the fisheries bill will allow us uh, to control fishing within our 200-mile e EZ, and uh, the, the fishing uh, community see great opportunities in there. And, and given that we only catch 40% of the, the fish in our EEZ at the moment by UK Scottish boats, compared to 85% that the Norwegians catch within their EEZ, do you agree that there is a... Uh, a sea of opportunity in there for our fishermen. Well, the, uh, Mr Chapman mentioned the relationship with Norway, and uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that the outcome of the negotiations with Norway have been deeply concerning uh, in, in, res in many respects to our fishing sector. So it's not just about the EU. Uh, it's a very complex pattern. Uh, but uh, I understand that it's a matter of practice. I mean, the, the question arises, what happens in, uh, when... Brexit occurs if it occurs in, in, in uh, March 2019, um, because that would be in the middle of a, a year for the purposes of the CFP. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, recognising the calendar year basis of fishing negotiations, it would seem sensible to agree a rolling over of arrangements agreed at December Council in 2018, including the existing access arrangements for the remainder of the 2019 calendar year, uh, uh, assuming that the final package is acceptable uh, to us. And whilst as much we disagree with Mr Gove about, his indication is he would be supportive of that position. Uh, and that, that was indicated on the 6th of uh, November. So, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the sea of opportunity is something that fishermen wish, wish to see. We are concerned that it may be traded away, bartered for other EU negotiations. We've asked for clarification that that won't happen. Uh, but uh, a, we are seeking, as we always do, and I work very closely with the SFF and all fishing organisations, including those that are not aligned to the SFF, to get the best possible outcome for all of our fishing. Okay, I accept that. And give, given that uh, you know scientific data is always going to be very important as far as fishing, as fishing, uh, fishing and fisheries is concerned, will Marine Scotland continue to collect and share scientific data post Brexit, and how will how will that be funded? Um, yes, and Marine Scotland. Uh, a, will continue the, the good work that they do in that respect. I mean, as to the overall funding issues, one of the uncertainties, the many uncertainties about Brexit, and I raised this specifically, Mr Gove, is the future of the MFF, which I think from memory is accounted for about, about £80 million of benefits over the, the period of the existing programme. So this is of immense benefit uh, for practical things like uh, upgrading ports and harbours, provision of facilities such as ice making and factory equipment, um, helping fish processors to update and improve their profitability and efficiency, but also in relation to areas of research in future and covering the aquaculture sector as well into things like better tackling uh, fish disease, which is so important in the aquaculture sector. So, in short, I've asked Mr Gove what post-Brexit will replace the EMF uh, and again, I'd be very keen to hear what the answer is. Okay, uh, Peter, you go. Okay, the, ne the next question is John. John Finney. <coughs> um, panel, it's about holding governments to, to a, a account, and we know that in evidence to the Environmental Audit Committee on the 1st of November, Michael Gove talked about the creation of a commission that would do that job. Indeed, he said, and I quote, that has the power potentially to fine or hold, otherwise hold government to account and certainly to hold public bodies other than government to account. He went on to talk about an example with the Commons Fishers policy, but he also said that he hoped but couldn't guarantee that a body would be in place on Brexit Day. What's your view on what should replace the European Commission and the European Court of Justice in holding the UK government and indeed devolved administrations to account? Minister, would you like I'm to... I'm always uh, slightly worried about the... <coughs> interpretation that is put on the European Court of Justice, particularly by UK ministers. Let's be 
clear about what we're talking about. The, the, the role of the European Court of Justice is not simply to hold to account national governments. The role of the European Court of Justice is to very often to answer inquiries about the law and to protect citizens who come uh, demanding um, a, a uh, redress. Uh, you know, famous European cases um, have indicated that it is this ability to say to the European Court of Justice that there is a right, there is a legislative right which is not being fulfilled, which should be fulfilled. I, I mean, I fail to understand the obsession with the ECJ from certain ranks of the, the Tory party. You know, the ECJ has performed a positive role in ensuring that citizens can be defended. Um, and I think the attempt to recreate it in watered-down form for a few of its functions in an unspecified way you know, is unsatisfactory. You know, my own view is that the, the, the role of the ECJ has been vital, for example, in our environmental matters, and should continue to be recognised in that way. And that is part of the, the, the folly of, of Brexit, that in actual fact, in throwing that out, you're throwing out opportunities for citizens to, to be protected, to get what they are due, and to ensure there is action that provides that. And I, I don't honestly believe that Michael Gove uh, wishes that to happen. And therefore, these things being talked about are um, window dressing. If, if uh, Minister, if no organisation was set up, and, and indeed this is a term I think you used earlier in your evidence about a governance gap, and whether that was part of your deep dive, I'm not quite sure I know what a deep dive is, but if that featured in your With diving deep, deep being down and seen yeah. the seabed in that regard. <laughs> The issue of, of how, for instance, the Scottish Government would be held to count over matters that, uh, um, yeah. within that area, for, for instance, farm payments, future farm payments, how would you see that being addressed, please? Well, continuing membership of the single market, uh, particularly in the customs union, possibly through the EEA route, you know, creates uh, uh, opportunities under the EFTA court for decisions to be reached. Now, the EFTA court recognises judgments of, of the European court, so there is a, you know, an interrelationship. So I think there are structures. There are structures that work well and are, are comprehensive. And I'd much rather see us accepting that than attempting to invent things which will be inevitably watered down in the, in the UK government's view. <coughs> it will not be possible for us to create those specifically in Scotland. So you know, the, the, the best solution is not to be involved in this process, which is a wrong process. The next best, best solution, uh, you know, not as good, but the next best solution is to say, let's remain within the single market and the customs union. And in those circumstances, those structures exist and things can be enforced. And they can be enforced in a way that benefits the individual citizen. But, but if, were we to accept that neither of these options... Uh, I don't accept what? that the, either of those options are impossible. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't just uh, don't accept that. I think that the evidence of the last year is that there is a growing realisation uh, that the route that abandons the single market and, and, and the customs union is the wrong route. We have gone from a situation in 12 months when the UK government was determined to have no transition or implementation through that route <coughs> to a position where they're now accepting that. Uh, we see a gradual progress towards that. And we need to argue for that. I mean, you know, we've already had raised the issue of the, the Irish border. In those circumstances, you know, the only feasible solution is the one that the Irish government is talking about in this, and which we are talking about in this. So I don't accept a thesis that would say these are not possible. If they are not possible, then I think there is an enormous diminution in the protection that will be afforded to people, individual citizens, on a whole range of ways. <coughs> not simply in ensuring that the government is held to account, but in actual fact defending basic rights, uh, which have been defended by the fact that we are part of the EU and will be put at risk and will be eroded. I have no doubt of that. Sorry, I, I think it's fair as uh, it was a question slightly on farm payments if the Cabinet Secretary would like to come in and then come back to Mr Finney. Um, well, in the scenario that Brexit occurs in March 2019, um, then the first question is, will, will we be in the CAP or out of the CAP? Uh, we're unclear about that because of Mr Duncan's remarks, which we discussed earlier, uh, and Mr Gove's lack of clarification um, but uh, in the event, and, and I don't know, it's really for them to, to say what their proposals are following the Prime Minister's Florence speech when she said there would be this transition. But, I mean, if there were to be uh, out, if we were to be out at the beginning of the transition period, then the question arises that who would be responsible for oversight and implementation of the compliance and disallowance provisions of the CAP? And the answer to that is the UK government haven't said anything about that whatsoever. 
So uh, that's another area where I'm afraid we're completely convener in the dark, so far as I know. Okay, John, you've, you've Actually, got to follow up and then there's yes, a few more. Very, very briefly, please. Are you able to, to suggest, and I know I alluded to Mr Gove's evidence that he gave there, are you able to, to indicate to what extent uh, scrutiny of any future arrangements is featured in discussions between the governments, please? I have to say in a very limited way, uh, because there is no detail, no flesh put on the bones of any proposals, essentially. Uh, and we are aware of that. I mean, for example, just to hark back very briefly to the issue of the withdrawal bill, you know, we are the ones who've said there needs to be further scrutiny of the decisions of ministers. And as you know, I have offered and negotiations taking place with the parliament about how we would put that in place. You know, that is being resisted by the UK government at, at Westminster. So you know, we are conscious of these issues and the issue of accountability. To say it doesn't, I mean, they appear to be avoiding accountability even to the House of Commons. Thank you. Thank you, John. There are three questions. I'd dearly like to try and get them in within the time scale, so I would urge short answers. It's going to be Gail Ross, Mike Rumbles, and, and then Jamie Green. So, Gail. Um, we've heard over the last few weeks from certain quarters that no deal is better than a bad deal. Um, in your opinion, what are the implications of no deal? No deal is a deal. Uh, sorry to be sort of theological in, in, in the, the complexity of this, but no deal is a deal. It is accepting the worst of all possible deals, which is that everything just stops. Um, there's actually a, a step beyond that, which is nobody knows whether there's a deal or not, which is a potential outcome. <coughs> the, the, the talks stall and they, nothing takes place and we amble towards at the end of March 2019 with no idea what's going to happen. But no deal is in a sense unthinkable because it's impossible to work out what happens. If you look at the border situation in Ireland, automatically there is the hardest of borders because there's, there are two different customs regimes. If you look at the airline issue, you know, the, 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 this, the, that, those arrangements lapse and you would have to deliberately opt back into them. And there's such a complexity in this. You know, the, the, over the last 45 years, the EU law, regulation, all those things have enmeshed themselves uh, you know, together. And the idea that then at a particular moment that is just broken, you know, the EU can sail on, it, has, it continues. What do we put in place, particularly, for example, if the withdrawal bill was not through? What would happen in those circumstances? We simply don't know. Now, of course, we you know, prepare ourselves in a sense by trying to think the unthinkable. But it's an incredibly difficult thing to do because you're looking at a set of circumstances where you say a lot of the basic underpinning regulatory structures would simply no longer have effect. Now, we could pass emergency legislation and put some back into effect, but that would be tricky to do because there are bits of them that you couldn't operate. So, no deal is, is a nonsensical proposition. The fact that the UK government uh, you know, is, is talking about it, and there are those within the UK government who want it, I regard as very scary indeed. Thank you. Uh, Mike, you can be briefly, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm give, uh, because of the time, I'll ask only one of you to answer each question. So, mm -hmm. Mike... If you'd like to lean on. My question is for one uh, of, of the witnesses, uh, Mike Russell particularly. Th th thank you. Um, you, if I may say so, uh, come across very constructively in all your dealings across portfolios and uh, with the other UK governments and, and, and other areas. And, and like yourself, we don't want to be where we are, but we are where we are. Um, what I would like to ask you is, across dealing with cross portfolios, in, in general principle, is it not much better in the different government departments across the Scottish government, that we actually, rather than um, wait and find out what the UK government wants, is it not better philosophically, politically, practically, to design our own systems right across the board and then put that up forward? Well, I, I can see where you're coming from, Mr <laughs> Rumbles. Uh, simply to say the portfolio <coughs> cabinet secretaries have the responsibility of taking forward their issues. I can simply advise them and work with them, and I deal with you know, my interface with the UK government. In this particular instance, the lack of information and the way in which we have the likelihood, the strong likelihood of having a common framework, and I refer you to the list of 111 powers, means that we are endeavouring to construct that framework, and that's the right way forward. It may well be that as that framework, if it takes place, does take place, we will be able to accelerate the process of developing those parts of the framework that are not to be dealt with by the, by, by, within the framework. There will be things that can be dealt with out with it, but we need to see, in my view, what the framework looks like first. Question. Thank you, Convener. Um, much has been said today about the retention of responsibilities and powers 
to the devolved administrations on the assumption that the Scottish Government will be responsible in the future for delivery of some form of agricultural subsidy or payment. Uh, what commitment can the Cabinet Secretary give Scottish farmers that all payments in future will be made on time and in full? Well, um, I, I, I uh, have discussed this uh, many, many times in, in this room with you all, and uh, I can assure you that my top priority remains uh, the proper administration of the CAP payments system, Pillars 1 and Pillar 2, and I'm very pleased that we have, uh, convener, over the last uh, couple of months, made considerable progress by paying out uh, a, a to uh, the Scottish farming community uh, loans at the rate of 90%. And I was very pleased that we were able to do so slightly earlier than I had set out. And I also have set out uh, a clear schedule setting out when uh, farmers, crofters and others should be able to expect to receive various payments. And I think that has been welcomed across the sector, uh, but we are not complacent, and uh, just this morning I had a weekly conference call with the officials, so I want to assure Mr Green that, that uh, I'm doing my best, as are my officials, to make sure that payments uh, are made in accordance with the scheme rules, uh, and uh, that loans will be used as, as, if necessary, in respect of Elfast next year. Uh, and I'm quite sure I will be sitting in this seat and discussing this topic again. Uh, before too many weeks elapse. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And thank you, Minister. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, David and Mike, for, for your evidence session this morning. I'm now briefly going to suspend the meeting. I would ask committee members to stay in place just while we change uh, witnesses. I suspend the meeting.
Okay. Thank you. We now move on to agenda item three, which is subordinate legislation. And this is consideration of one affirmative instru instrument as detailed on the agenda. The committee will take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity. The motion seeking the approval of the affirmative instrument will be considered at item four. Members should note there have been no representations to the committee on this instrument. I'd like to welcome back Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Co Connectivity. I'd like to welcome Greg Chalmers, the Team Leader, and Fiona McLean, the Solicitor. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make a brief opening statement? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, this statutory instrument revokes six grant schemes that are redundant and have been superseded. The proposed revocations are therefore technical in nature, removing expired instruments from the books. Equivalent instruments have already been revoked in the rest of the UK. The Scottish Government does not anticipate any negative impact on business or the voluntary sector should this instrument come into force. Current grant funding for the maritime sector is delivered via the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, the EMFF. The fund is used along with Scottish Government funding to co-finance projects and provide support for sustainable development within the fishing and aquaculture sectors and conservation of the marine environment, helping to deliver growth and jobs in coastal communities. Since its opening in January 2015, the EMF scheme has awarded over £46 million to eligible project proposals. I therefore hope the committee is content to support the motion that I move in my name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Are there any questions from the members on this instrument? Uh, John. Yes, I'm more than happy to support this. I just wonder, is, is there a lot of uh, redundant secondary legislation still kind of lying around that needs to be cleared up, or is this, are you, is this the clearing up process? Um, is that the general question for yeah. the whole government? <laughs> no, 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 I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> or is it just about this? Just about this, yeah. Well, I think that all of the listed are, um, schemes are spent. There's six. I mean, I could read them out if you want, but... The Red Act, Cabinet right. Secretary. I think if, if there's no more in relation to this particular area, um, no. that, that would be confirmation, I think, enough for Mr. Yeah, I mean, Mason. if it were just about fishing, for example. Okay. Yeah. Uh, none. Thank uh, you. Richard. I can actually see how one out. I'll just pick one out. Fishing uh, vessels, temporary financial assistance. One of the conditions for receiving the grant was that 75% of the crew of the vessel were ordinarily resident in the UK in the last day of the relevant qualifying period of 1982. So, you know, in the number of years that have passed, I'm sure many of those people are now uh, retired, uh, for instance. So that's another reason why you get rid of that scheme. That's a useful observation. Um, I'm not sure it necessarily requires an answer. Um, if there are no other questions, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I am... I, I, um, Allowed to offer you uh, closing remarks, I, I assume that your opening remarks will have covered most of what you've said. So unless you want to make a closing statement, I suggest we move on to agenda item four, uh, which is uh, the formal consideration of motion 08383 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, asking the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee to recommend that the fishing vessels and fish farming Miscellaneous Revocations Scotland Scheme 2017 be approved. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to move the motion and ask if you have any comments you wish to make? Uh, so moved and no further comments. Okay. Are there any comments from the members? Okay. The question, therefore, is that is motion S5M08383 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes our consideration of item four, and I am again going to briefly suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to depart. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Okay, we're now going to move on to agenda item five, which is subordinate legislation. Uh, the agenda item is considerative consideration of two negative instruments as detailed on the agenda. 
No motions to annul have been received in relation to these instruments. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to any of the instruments? Okay, that is agreed. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes today's committee business and I now formally close the meeting. <laughs>